Hey everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks. I'm the assistant editor here at PC Gamer, and we have a couple very special guests with us on the show today. First of all, Liam O'Neill, associate producer at Fat Shark Games. How you it's, doing? Uh, it's great to be here. Good fun to see you guys again. And it's always nice to be in your office. I love the cookie wall. Well, <laughs> we love having you, and we love the cookie wall as well. Uh, and also, Brad Logston, senior producer at Trendy Entertainment. Yes. How you doing? I'm, I also love the cookie wall. I'm doing good. <laughs> cookie wall is popular here. Yes. It is. Uh, and then, of course, as always, our editor-in-chief, Commander Evan Lottie. <laughs> Hi, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hi. I didn't mean to put you on spot with the, the no. commander there. Oh, don't forget our little friend here. Oh, yes, and the caco demon, of yes. course, for a... For, uh, Posterity, I think. Mm -hmm. Of course. He's not mic'd up for some reason. No, he's not. He's, <laughs> he's shy, usually. He speaks in tongues, so <laughs> sure, it's a bit awkward. Um, we got a great show for you today. Of course, we're going to be talking about PvE multiplayer games because both of our guests here are developing those. So, you know, that's convenient. Mm. Um, we're going to be talking about real money economies in games because we just ran a great story about uh, $400 plus knives skin knife skins in CSGO. Mm. Uh, our regular Cat Fantastic quiz is apocalyptic, apocalyptic wasteland themed this week, Ooh, so nice. uh, it's a little bit of a surprise for you guys. <laughs> um, and then we'll also be talking about video game novels, and finally, kind of what games we're looking forward to coming up this autumn, because it is the first day of fall tomorrow, in mm -hmm. fact, um, which the San Francisco weather went ahead and dropped 20 <laughs> degrees since yesterday for, yes. so thank you for that. That was quick. Yeah, it was, it was a, a big drop. But first of all, uh, let's start off with now playing... What are you guys playing nowadays? I guess, sir, uh, Liam, what, what have you been playing? I've been playing a lot of Metal Gear Solid, the new game. And yeah. I'm slowly working my way through it. Like, I had no idea how big it was going to be. <laughs> but having a good time with that. I actually really enjoy it. Yeah, we've talked about Metal Gear a couple times. James, our intern, just beat it recently. Oh, well. how, how far are you? Do you know? Yeah, about I guess there's two different questions, right? Yeah. There's hours, <laughs> there's, there's missions, there's hours, percentage. I've, I've lost count of hours. Okay. But as far as percentage, I think I'm about 50%, something like that. Okay. So, yeah, I'm really wow. enjoying it. Huge fan of the series, so yeah, it's good stuff. I actually, unfortunately, I kind of lost steam with that game. I mentioned this, mm -hmm. I think, on the show last week, and mm -hmm. I, I got 30 hours in. I was playing every night like crazy, yeah. and then I just kind of burnt out a little. See, the point I'm at with Metal Gear is I'm, I'm, like, I'm only like 15 or 20 hours in, but I need to sort of find strategies that aren't highly optimized and highly successful. Uh, because I feel like I'm just walking up to a base, grabbing the most isolated guy, interrogating him, and then just you know moving into the base and dismantling it. Yeah. And, it, and the game is more fun when I'm not taking the, the cleanest route to victory. You know sure. what I mean? Sure. I mean, as soon as I researched the water pistol, <laughs> that was like my go-to weapon. It's not killing anything, but it's good fun. So I know exactly what you mean. Interesting. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. I still haven't played yet. You know, it's funny. I, I, I was a huge Metal Gear fan in the very, very beginning, and then I just lost interest. Like, I remember... And this is this shows you how dated I am in the Metal Gear series. But I remember playing. I think it was the second one, and you got in the raid in section when you're on the on the 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 what are they like, oil derricks or whatever. Yeah. And I was going, I don't like this. Like I just I'm not enjoying this. And mm. I never really came. I and I know that subsequent ones are really good, and I, I wanted to play them, but I just never re-engaged. Um, but everyone everyone's talking about the new one, so I feel like I need to get back in. It's a very acquired taste. I mean, there, there's something interesting that's happening with a, a, a very story-driven Japanese game. Yes. Adopting a sandbox structure. I mean, that when's the last time that happened? I don't yeah. know. I, I can't think of another instance. And it's it's interesting how how quiet uh, Mel Gear's story is. I mean, how how sort of in the background it is, and how easy it is to avoid. Whereas really? in in four and three and two and one, it's all in your face. You know, ninety minute cutscenes. That's that's a cliche. Completely linear. I mean, everything yeah. in the yeah, it's, it's 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 very much on rails. And I guess this one is not. So to some extent, it repre represents almost like what. Um, Resident Evil 4 did for me, right? Yeah. Where it's these this total collision of East and West ideas. You know, you have the sort of storytelling and structure of a Resident Evil game in, in that game, but with modern, you know, for the time in 2004, I guess it was, mm -hmm. um, action mechanics and, and shooting mechanics. And that really re revi revitalized the series. So yeah. I think that's part of why people are responding to it. What about you, Evan? Are you playing Metal Gear right now? I'm, I'm playing Counter-Strike, as always. <laughs> uh, we were talking last week about esports and how... It's just, That's your esport. It, it, it's your hobby. It's your uh, you're perpetually playing that game. If you play Dota, if you play anything, if you play yeah. League, yeah, it's um, a lifestyle. Yeah, Chris, Chris, exactly. Chris last week on the show, Chris Thurston from the UK was saying that he, whenever anybody asks him what is he playing this week or like right now, he'll never say Dota because he's just always playing yeah. Dota. Right, and right. It gets to that point. It's a good, like, fallback game when you have an extra couple of hours to kill. You just yeah. go on Dota or League of Legends or whatever. I think it's funny when you get those lifestyle games, usually you play your lifestyle game for an hour and then you play the game you're playing right now. 
Yeah. It's like, let me go and get my, like, oh, I got my fix in, and then I go play the game. Eventually. You, don't, you don't even consider it really the game that you're playing. It's just <laughs> part of your daily, it's like reading the newspaper in the old days. You're like, oh, I read my exactly. newspaper for the day. Well, I played my couple matches of Counter-Strike. Now I'm ready to do my day. Mm -hmm. I think it's like hanging out with your friends as well, because you have that, like, group of friends, and you always play together. Yeah. It's just that default thing. Like, you're on Skype, just a group of friends having a social event, and it's like, oh, we're also playing League of Legends. <laughs> but that's secondary, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Sure. Yeah. What about you, Brad? What have you been playing lately? Uh, I have a chance to be all over the map because I play a wide range of games. Lately, funny enough, I was a late trainer to Diablo 3. I, ah. When it first came out, I played it on PS4 a little bit, um, on the PS4 ski, but I never really played it on the PC. So recently got in, I'm in Torment, I'm at the end of Torment 2 about now, so I'm like going through the, the bounties and the rifts and whatnot, just kind of grinding away. So I'm thinking about running a Season 4 character. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Recently got in. I'm on my fourth playthrough. Is what you just said to <laughs> no, us? No, no, no. I'm on torment. I'm on my first playthrough. I guess all okay. the way through. I'm in torment two. Oh, so I thought I'm you playing. had to unlock the torments. Or am I wrong? About yeah, that? you have to get to the end of like uh, the campaign mode, and then you okay. unlock adventure mode. And adventure mode allows you to play through. I think it unlocks the first three or four torment torments right out the gate. Oh, okay, um, okay. So I played around in torment one, got some gear, and I'm in torment two. I could probably go to torment three, but I think I'd kill things too slow. So mm. I'm kind of staying in torment two to grind up and try to get enough pieces of a set that I can have some mm. bonuses and move on. Well, Diablo was always funny to me. Like, I mean, I guess right now is not a bad time to get into it because they mm. did just do that big update, yeah. um, which I, you know, I haven't played Diablo 3 in a while, but I hear had some pretty, like, wide-sweeping changes for the game. Um, but it's always funny to me because when I went back and started playing Diablo 3, like, this summer... I was just shocked at how easy everything was. Like the first playthrough on the game, even on hard mode, it just feels like the t like the first whole first game is the tutorial, no, right? I like feel the exact same way. It, I, you're just sweeping through areas. I actually had a hard time with that because I, I wanted to play through the game. Everyone's been talking about it for a while, and I never really dug my teeth into it. So I was determined to make it through. But when I was playing through the campaign, a lot of times I'd come to work the next day and just go, I I mean, it's I don't even think. Like, mm -hmm. I want to, yeah. I, I have to play something else after I'm done just to kind of get my brain engaged. And I, I have a, a game that probably no one has played. It's a game called Star Conflict. Um, it's kind of like my fallback game. Yeah. Um, it's a, like, arena space shooter. Um, like mm. a, almost like a Star citizen -y type thing, but much more. Um, it's like, like Call of Duty and Star Citizen had a love child. And uh, <laughs> I, I've right. been playing it for, like, a year. It's my, it's my go-to, like, in the background game that I play. Cool. Um, but that was how I palate cleanse after I'm like, okay, well, I just sat there and just click the same but it was funny so and it was uh to, t to that point right so i was going through the campaign and i got this ring um like three quarters away through the campaign that spawned these little like gobliny things that just suicide and explode against something <laughs> and like the amount of damage they were doing was inordinately higher than anyone else's health so i remember when i fought belial i walked in and like he's going through his speech, and he's like, "Oh, I'm the, the whatever of the thing," and then he stops and he just dies. And because like, <laughs> the four suicide goblin just run into it, his health just goes dunk, and he's. I'm going. I don't even know what he does. I, I don't even know. He didn't do anything. He just fell over. Was that? And then I mean, I got to adventure mode and played him in, in torment, and he's a lot. I actually got to see what his mechanics were. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's it's definitely like training wheels, and you just kind of like, all right, I'm going to the store, yeah. biking along. I think that's what really makes Diablo great is you you can kind of grind for like 20 hours. You're having a long, long time, but then then you find that one item, and you yeah. just think, like, yeah. I'm a genius. I can now kill Belial in one second. Right. Like, it's just, You're it makes a genius, you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Not it's, the guy who you, put the design in But there. it makes <laughs> you feel really, really good about yourself, and it's like, I am now a god. Yep, yep, and I, I think agree That's what those that. games do what, really well. What is, that, what is it about watching numbers go up that's, that's so <laughs> entertaining? It's, it's something, like, primal to gamers, I think. You know, just, oh, I'm, I've increased this by 20%, and this other stat by 15. Oh, my God, I've done it. Yeah. You know? Well, and there's also something to be said about, like, when games will make it so that enemies have 10,000 health, but you're dealing, you're only ever dealing, like, damage in chunks of 100. So it's like, you could have just divided everything by 100, but it wouldn't be nearly as satisfying. It wouldn't be nearly yeah. as fun. Yeah, I mean, you guys both have loot systems in your game. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there is, how, how do you approach making that act of accumulation the most interesting, the most rewarding, uh, but not like overdoing it, you know? Oh man. Is, is there such a thing as overdoing it? In our case, you just approach <laughs> it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I and mean, we just keep on trying just things. Just reevaluating. Mm -hmm. So many times. We, like, yeah. we've, we're reevaluating our loot system yet again. I mean, there's so many different knobs that you tweak when it comes to, like you're talking about that sensation of, of feeling what we call power spikes, where you're going through and you're like, okay, the enemy has 100 health and I'm doing 10 damage, and then something happens and now I'm doing 70 damage. 
and it went from killing the thing in 10 hits to killing the thing in three hits. And then having the next one where like now I'm an hour later and all of a sudden I'm back to that same equation again. And like making that feel organic, but knowing that at the same time it's very arithmetic, it's, it's, it's just math, you know, it's like all yeah. relative, but the player needs to not perceive it as relative. Um, making that rewarding is very, very tricky. It's a yeah. feeling more than, more than anything else. Hmm. And for us, it's very much, I mean, because we're a co-op game, we talked about this before a lot, where we want you to be able to play the game for 200 hours and still, like, invite your new friend. And it shouldn't be that situation where, okay, you just sit down and grind for 20 hours and then we can play together. You yeah. know, we want them to be able to play yeah. from the start. So it's, it's that balance of making sure that the loot is exciting, that you feel like a, you've accomplished something in the long run. You can still be grinding for gear and finding interesting items 200 hours in, but you should also be able to play with your friends. So what we try to do is, like, create crazy situations where the team has to just perfectly execute the situation. Just how do we deal with the fact that we now have a, a kind of a rat's ogre and a storm armor patrol at the same time? How do we handle that? Mm -hmm. If we saved all our grenades from earlier, we've got a damage boost potion. Awesome. If we don't have that, oops. <laughs> we try to keep it keep it kind of chaotic, and I yeah. think that adds to it. And it seems like in Vermintide, from from what I understand, you guys uh, you can sort of like choose to go for a, a greater reward by by going for higher difficulty. Yeah. So right. we have the side objectives and the level, and one of the big ones is uh, a grimoire, which is like a, a kind of book infused with this like kind of chaotic power, I guess. Mm -hmm. You pick that up, and it's actually going to reduce the max HP of everybody in the party. Mm. So one player picks that up, walks around with it, it reduces everybody's max HP. So it's like an intentional debuff. Yeah, exactly. Huh. But, but if you manage to get yeah. to the end of the level, you're pretty much guaranteed better loot. So it's that risk-reward, and it also kind of adds to it. Like, when you're playing a level 30 minutes, you're at 20 minutes in, you start to feel that, like, we're almost there. Maybe we should just drop this now. Maybe we should just <laughs> guarantee the victory. But no, we want the best possible loot. So mm -hmm. we try to keep it... A little bit chaotic at That's all That's really times. cool. I like that. Well, myself, I, unfortunately, I wrote about this in my highs and lows of the week last Friday that I was house-sitting for the last, like, all weekend in the end of last week. So I basically had just, like, a tiny little laptop to play on. Um, so the game I was playing a lot of this weekend was actually Fly Wrench. I don't know if you guys Fly know Wrench. about that. No. Um, it's kind of flown, no pun intended, under the radar a little bit. Um, but it's by Messoff, Mark Essen, the creator of Nidhogg, um, mm. who, full disclosure, was my TA in the game design program at UCLA. Um, and I played Fly Wrench a long time ago. He had a real free version that he released. And essentially, the, the only thing I can compare it to really is like kind of Super Meat Boy style. It's not a platformer, but you're this just little line, like a white line. Um, very, very minimalistic graphics. And you have a button that makes you flap, like a little, like, just like fold. Mm -hmm. um, and that turns you red and like flaps you up in the air like a bird. Um, and you can't touch the walls of any level. And you can go only go through walls of your own color. So you're white when you're straight, not flying, and you're red when you're flapping. It's like a weird Ikaruga time. I was going to say that too. It, it's similar, yeah. but it's nowhere. It's not nearly like bullet heli or anything. Yeah, so yeah, you're in these yeah. very linear, very short level paths. Um, and then lastly, the, you have a last button that makes you spin and turn green. And when you're spinning, you can touch walls and go through green stuff. <laughs> and so you get these like, just like Nidhogg, it's like super fast paced, mm -hmm. right? It's just like go, 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 go. And like you have to like, you get in these weird situations where you have to like fall switching between white and red so that you're like going through alternating gates and then you have to go up and so you have to like flap to get enough momentum and then hold in red so you can't flap anymore and you have to like go through the red gates and then right as you peek out of them you like flap again to get through the white stuff <laughs> it's like really frantic um but really really fun uh the one thing though is like i played like there's like 200 some levels and i think the first like 150 of the levels are just like introducing concepts to you and then wow. the last like quarter of the game is just like hard as hell sounds like portal like, yeah it's, i guess so yeah maybe m plus a little bit too oh sure yeah it's a similar it's a similar vibe to that like yeah. i because it, it's this flappy game that like kind of sounds like ikaruga but like it feels like n plus it feels like super meat boy in that you're like just going 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 you die you restart you die you restart you get Man. through the level you go to cool. the next one so you've like, been playing flappy bird nightmare mode basically <laughs> right. yeah i yeah. love me some m plus that's for sure i need to check it out no cool. but fly wrench it's it's a it's a cool one <laughs> um i think i might be streaming it actually later this week hopefully but cool. we might not I'm not sure yet. Uh, TwitchCon is later this weekend and is yeah. taking over my life, which is exciting. Um, but moving on, let's talk about... We talked about this a little bit already. Uh, PvE multiplayer games and online co-op games. You know, the, the similar things. Um, 
there's been this resurgence, and we talked about this two week or two months ago on the show, our very first live show, about how there's this huge surge of PvP online, like objective-based games. You know, there's Overwatch. We've seen Dirty Bomb gaining popularity. We've seen like all these games that are like uh, PvP objective games. Mm -hmm. But we're also now seeing this kind of other rise of or return, I don't know if they ever really left, maybe we can talk about that, but of like PvE games where it's you're working together with people against these hordes of computer in whatever form that takes. So in in the case of Liam, your game uh, Warhammer End Times Vermintide, it's kind of like a Left 4 Dead sort of style of four of you people moving through a linear level and in the case of your game Brad, is like you know, it, it's the tower defense action game where you're all defending one spot. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they've taken... There's also Battleborn is a similar... It, that's almost entirely PvE, right? Or It's a bit... It, it's, it's mixed. It's yeah. a bit unclear, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I wasn't sure. That's why I honestly... The videos I saw kind of felt like it was PV, PvE. <laughs> right. right. Well, and that's one of the things I want to talk about is that these games are like... These PvP games... Or these PvE games that are coming out are kind of almost modeling themselves similarly to the PvP games that are rising in popularity. But, like... I guess the question I want to ask is, like, is the fact that they're not competitive make, like, does that make it less compelling in a certain way, or...? It adds its own, I mean, as a developer, it adds a very different set of challenges to overcome, because when you're in a PvP game, um, you create a number of systems that then players use organically to create gameplay. So you're not really necessarily concerned with inventing bottomless gameplay for players to play for you know, weeks and weeks and months on end, they, you just need to create enough tools where they can discover those things on their own. I mean, look at the old, um, old Battlefield videos where people would go and spend hours just driving trucks off of cliffs and things like that just because they would invent fun things to do together in these combat, like, what was it, the one where like, these are the guys like jumping out of planes and sniping someone and then jumping back in the next plane? That wasn't the design, yeah. that was, it. It was just the <laughs> mechanic that was in there that someone would mess with. Um, I, I saw I saw an amazing gif yesterday where somebody shoots a helicopter as a helicopter falls off a cliff. Then he jumps off the cliff and somehow catches up to it, <laughs> jumps in the helicopter, at, and he's like out of bounds. So as he's falling down the cliff, it's, you a warning, it's like you know you're going to die automatically in ten seconds. Falls in the cockpit, jumps in, like drives it off. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and the you know when you're making a PVE game. Those moments are a lot harder to make endless because the you know the artificial intelligence or however you're creating your environments and mechanics are all going to be they can get very samey. You know that was one of the brilliances of Left 4 Dead. Honestly, their AI director allowed it to be and feel organic, even though it was a repetitive, you know, PVE experience. And I think that it's it. I don't think it's less compelling. I just think it can be a lot more challenging with the way consumers are looking at games now to create an experience like that that really grabs them for the amount of time they want to be grabbed by a game. Sure. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, like, one of the things that's great about having a PvE game is, at least for me personally, like, I played a, a Payday a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. It was, my, like, my first time I actually played Payday. And uh, one of my first experiences was me getting into a game, and everybody's really high level, and I had no idea what I was going to do. So I was just, like, apologizing. I'm like, sorry, guys, I really do not understand what I'm doing right <laughs> now. I'm completely carrying me. Yeah, and, and one of the guys just went, no problem, we'll boost you. It's just like that doesn't happen a lot in competitive games. In competitive games, it's a lot more kind of, oh, no, we have the noob on our team, but those guys are much better. Like that's kind of the problem of, of MOBA games, I think, is you get that very competitive environment, and it can become kind of toxic. Well, in a PvE game, it's always going to be more, it's us against the game, so let's work as a team. Let's make sure to actually work together and, and yeah. be friendly to each other. Definitely. Because it, it feels higher stakes when you're playing against a person, right? Mm -hmm. Like it always, like that was something that was well, honestly. gets involved. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, whether you like it or not, we're all sure. kind of like, there's a guy that's trying to kill me right now, and I don't want him. I mean, like, you yeah. have that mental, no matter what. Because I was never, like, pissed that I was running, uh, that I'd lost an hour of my life losing a League of Legends game. I was just annoyed that that guy beat me. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's what yes, it's, that's So right. it's definitely an ego question. But if you're playing a game like Vermintide or, or Left 4 Dead and Data Swallow, it's more like, okay, we lost that round. Let's do it again. Let's do it better right. this time. Right. So, so this is something that Brad and I talked about earlier when we were playing Dungeon Defenders 2, um, is the idea of, like, how okay are you with, like, your player base failing you know like are you are you all like in a pve game like that or in a pvp game you like never want to fail you like even though the game is designed literally to make you have a 50 percent win rate like that is how they program the matchmaking yep. you never want to lose yep. and like how how okay are you with like your player base like 
losing, you know, because ideally you'd want them to, to be winning more than they were losing rather than a PvP game. Yeah, I mean, we, we actually, we want you to lose from time to time because it's <laughs> yeah. supposed to be, you know, you losing the game just means that the game is challenging in our case. It's very much the case of, like, if we keep it too easy, it's never going to be gratifying to get to the end of a level. And, again, you know, talking about the, the side objectives that we were mentioning earlier, that's kind of part of, you're probably going to lose now, but you might get something really cool if you do it. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do? What do you want to go for? And it's a fun kind of challenge when you're playing with your friends on a Friday night. Like, do we go for the full-on, really deadly experience, or do we kind of just go for something easier just to relax? And I yeah. think it depends. You give the players those options. They're going to choose whatever makes sense for them. So I think losing is okay. <laughs> you know, not to, uh, on a side subject to that, something you just mentioned when you said, you know, playing with the friends on a Friday night, that's also, when you were mentioning the insert, the resurgence of PVE type experiences, and I do think they're coming back to a certain degree, um, the biggest thing that I get excited about, even, you know, we're making, uh, you know, DD2 to be a, a couch co-op game, but I miss couch co-op games. Yeah. I really, really do. And, uh, you know, I, you were mentioning N+, plus, uh, or I mentioned N+, plus earlier when you were talking about your game. And, man, like, I played that with my brother and my cousin at, like, 3 or 4 in the morning. Like, we're all exhausted. We, we would play where every character was the same color, so you never knew who you were. And it was always like, I may be still alive or maybe not, but everyone has to pretend <laughs> they are because you may be the one that's still going. Um, and that was just so much fun on the couch with your friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think, uh, even right now on, uh, you know, on the consoles or even on PC, when you're looking around for a new good experience to play with someone next to you, they're not easy to find. Mm -hmm. And I think Definitely. there is a hunger for those kind of games out there, especially with the, you know, the consoles coming back and Steambox and people playing PCs on their couch now with controllers. You know, that's something that people want. Well, it's yeah. interesting because a lot of those local co-op couch co-op games, we did a story about couch co-op games relatively recently. and. It's interesting because I think that they're almost, like their success is almost self-limited to a certain degree because they will enforce couch co-op. They want them to be only local co-op experiences. Something like Towerfall. Yeah, same screen in other words. Exactly, same right. screen. Yeah, yeah. like Towerfall is, Towerfall Ascension is one of my favorite multiplayer games ever, right? It is, I think, like, as close to, and this is going to be blasphemous for being on PC Gamer, but as close to, like, Super Smash Brothers level yeah. of, like, satisfying fighting game as you can get, <laughs> except it's only local co-op, which is great because that experience is ten times better with people right next to you yelling at you, right? But the fact that it doesn't have online co-op is turning people, turns some people away. It turns yeah. a certain crowd away, and it limits the success that that game can find. Honestly, the only reason why I did not get Towerfall is because of that very... There you thing. go. I'm like, I actually don't have... A lot of people that I probably be able to pull in nowadays to play that game with me, so I'm yeah. gonna skip it. Yeah, I'm I'm really hopeful that Steam Link, which is the the yeah. peripheral that's gonna be yeah. you're gonna use to stream from your PC to your TV. Mm -hmm. You know, basically using your PC, you know, from a distance in, in your house or whatever over your network. I'm really hopeful that's gonna sort of start to change the culture of PC gaming uh, yeah. and sort of broaden it into. We'll see more of these couch multiplayer games catch on because there's an audience. Hopefully, I mean, I think it remains really unclear. Uh, how widely adopted that and Steam Controller are going to be. I don't know if you guys have opinions on that, but because I don't, I don't think of marketing as one of Valve's strengths necessarily. <laughs> they're, they're not really great at like shouting up from the rooftops about themselves necessarily. Like, how, how are they going to get this thing in Best Buy? You know, that's mm -hmm. that's what I want to know. Um, how are they going to make people understand what it, what this thing is that it uses your computer? across your router like that's a hard concept for someone to explain in a retail environment yeah so. and especially to the kind of i mean there's there is definitely a segment of the community uh, of the audience that would probably like that but just have no idea how to even set it up yeah. totally you know and you're not gonna be able to teach someone that in three minutes in best buy when you're trying to sell it to them yeah, no. yeah. i think it's so groundbreaking for like the way you're gonna play games like i've only tried the steam controller really briefly but my mm. just instant experience was oh this is really cool i have no idea what i'm doing which is like my <laughs> feeling and you can probably make it work but I feel like that's going to be an investment that somebody just like picking it up at Best Buy, going home, plugging it in, probably not going to get the best experience right now. So I think Valve are probably just waiting around to have people figure them out perfectly first. Like a couple yeah. years down the line, maybe once it gets to that point where it's plug and play and anyone can figure it out, it'll be great. You know, it's funny though. So um, for Dungeon Defenders 2, we're both console and PC. So we're doing controller and split screen right now on the console first, and then we're going to move that over to the PC. And, uh, you know, but it came out on early access first on mm -hmm. PC, that where we started. And we actually prioritized, we, we down-prioritized controller and split screen in the beginning. Because we were like, well, I mean, yes, people do that on PC, but, I mean, it's, it's mostly mouse and keyboard world. That's what people play with on PC predominantly. 
I, I personally, I'm sure Phil over in the corner is going to say he wasn't. I was personally kind of surprised at just how, just how passionate and how many people were out there that were like, why is this not controller split screen on PC? Mm. And I'm going, hmm. all right, well, that's like the five people that didn't know. Like, no, there's more and there's more and there's more. <laughs> and you were just telling the story earlier today about you, when you played Dungeon Defenders 1, did the super resolution, had two people playing on two monitors at once. And I'm yeah. going, a lot more people than you, than uh, me as a developer, a lot more people than you would initially think instinctually a couple of years ago actually did have controllers and setups to play couch co-op with people and wanted to do that. Mm. And they were clamoring for us to get that in because they wanted to have that back that experience back. I think there's a market there for those kind of games. No, I okay. definitely agree. And uh, Rocket League has proved that That's as a, well. Yeah. Rocket League has split screen and ca controller support on PC. And, yeah. and matchmaking. And yeah, you, you and also get it for free if you pre-ordered the Steam controller what? and maybe if you buy it rocket league oh and, oh, right. and portal yeah, yeah, 2 yeah i forgot about that i completely forgot about that yep. strange well it's interesting you so you mentioned steam link hopefully making local co-op more prevalent but also another thing that'll i'm holding out hope that'll help is a uh, nvidia just announced this new update to geforce experience where the big selling point that they were doing about it was that you can like jump in and take control of a friend's game oh, over really? the internet and then like help them with a part, and then, like, jump back out. And then as, like, a footnote in that announcement, they were like, also, you can do local co-op games through the internet with it. And that was, like, just, like, a, yeah. a oh, bullet. Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and that blows my mind because yeah. now I could play, and maybe, you know, the, the, the latency is not going to be good enough to do something like Towerfall, but, like, when I was streaming Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time, um, the developers were in the chat and they said we just heard about this was like right after the announcement they were mm -hmm. like we just heard about this NVIDIA thing and like we're going to look into it and the game like Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time where you're playing co-op with one other person and like time isn't like you know a, a ping is not the most important part of right, it right. like that's a really cool thing to be able to do local co-op without having to like download Hamachi I don't even know yeah, if yeah. anybody yeah. uses oh, Hamachi anymore God. back in the day yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to use Hamachi for like Minecraft I think yeah. a lot like, it was always it, it never worked quite right like, yeah. it worked some of the time but most of the time you're just like alright hold on I gotta get this thing working again I don't know why it's broken that's part of the experience that was <laughs> that's, that's part of being a PC gamer most of the time you're like get under the hood uh, yeah all of a sudden, my mic's feeding back. It worked just fine for the last year, but now it's not, and we have a thing to do. So. There's always that one guy with a broken microphone. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Or as, as Chris Livingston that said... Was that was usually me. I was, no, see, Obviously. Like, hold on. It wasn't that my mic was broken. It's that, like, listen, I like, I'm a sound guy. I like audio. And I would be damned. Sorry. I'll be damned if I'm going to not have my speakers. Yeah. So I'll have, like, the mic here, but I'm going to have my speakers going. So I get feedback all the time and be complaining on Inventor Teams. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm not turning my speakers off. <laughs> I'm not putting a pair of headphones on. You don't have to deal with it. Uh, so we talked about this game earlier too. Diablo three is another PVE mm -hmm. experience that is also online, and it's a very different kind of setup mm -hmm. um, than either of the games you guys are developing. At least, um, I guess maybe it's more Vermintide top down. I guess that's not the best way to describe it. But you know, I, I mean, for me personally, like I, I love Diablo games to bits. Like I've always enjoyed them. I, I played so much of Diablo two just with my <laughs> friends, and I, I feel like if you compare Diablo three and Vermintide, for me. I played Diablo 3 a lot solo, just because it kind of, for me, it always just made sense. Like, I'm watching a movie and kind of grinding at the same time. With Vermintide, it's always four players. That's the most fun. Or you have the bots as well if you want to play by yourself. But yeah. it's so much more focused around the team play. Yeah. Whereas I felt like Diablo, even if I kind of put three other players in there, we were just kind of, everyone had bigger health bars and it was taking us longer to kill stuff. Yeah. But I never really felt like we had to cooperate to get the best out of the game. You know what I mean? I think one of the one of the sensations we're, we're, we're touching on here with PVE is that a lot of these games have in common and actually taps into something that's like kind of ancient in games is this idea of subtraction, mm -hmm. where you are clearing a board mm -hmm. and doing that with other people is I mean just Pac-Man that Pac-Man mm -hmm. is subtraction Galaga is subtraction Space Invaders like that process of elimination of, of making all the stuff go away on the screen mm -hmm. like at a very base level yeah is somehow satisfying I think. Uh, well, like I think you're, it, you're cleaning, kind of, you know. Yeah. It's it's uh, and, and Diablo has that in common, obviously. But in the case of Diablo, you're cleaning and stuff is popping up as well. Yeah, yeah. It, that's because of the loot. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. cleaning it in a casino. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to make a beautifully smooth transition to our next topic, one of the things also about Diablo and cleaning up is that Diablo had this lovely in-game economy system that or in real money Lo economy. lovely is a generous word oh yes <laughs> contentious is probably a good um, word. Yeah. and it 
it kind of almost to a certain extent ruined the PvE nature of the yeah. game. So we've talked about that a lot because our, our Dungeon Defenders as a franchise in Diablo have a lot of similarities. You know, we're both a stat-driven loot-based game. Um, we both have those kind of, uh, you know, centralized loops around acquiring loot, wanting to get more loot. Um, the way we progress right now in D2 with we have Nightmare, they have uh, Torment. We kind of, we've, we've shared a lot of those kind of ideas. Um, and we've talked a lot about the Diablo auction house system. And um, a lot of our discussions were around the fact that when you're in a loot-based game, your excitement is over, a lot of your excitement is over how you acquire the thing that you want. You know, how do you get the perfect role? How do you, what is the things that you should be doing as a player? Because whether we know it consciously as developers or mature gamers or unconsciously as more casual gamers, every gamer understands the, okay, here's my goal, how am I going to get there mental structure. They all think that way. Um, and when Diablo 3 came out, and this is one of the reasons why I said I was late to Diablo 3, this is one of the reasons why I was. When it came out and they did the auction house, your gamer instinct went, the way I'm supposed to get this stuff is there. Yeah. Not by playing the game, but by getting enough currency to get that, whether it be money or grinding. And that's not a fun loop. Mm -hmm. Like, just going to a thing, going to a shopping mall to find exactly the right role on a list and then buying that thing is not entertaining. Yeah, loops. you don't get to experience luck, for example. And Yeah, exactly. you don't. And, it, it, mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden... Even if you didn't want to do that, psychologically you're now going inside your head, that is the most efficient path. And yeah. Diablo by nature is a game of efficiency. I don't and know, so, man. A lot of people get played cookie clicker. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, I, I think it really took a, a, a very big chunk out of the core psychological driver for why you want to play a Diablo game. Yeah. And while it was there, even if you tried to turn your mind off from it, you always knew in the back of your head, I'm trying to get this drop. I'm trying to find this thing. I could also just find spend five bucks. And it's and it's tough because you can almost I mean think way back. You know, but the period between Diablo two and Diablo three, you can understand where they're coming from to mm -hmm. an extent because Blizzard was saying, well, people are going to do this anyway. Mm. They're going to do it on eBay. Yeah. It's going to be messier. It's going to create different problems for us. So why don't we just internalize it and build it ourselves and solve that problem? Didn't work out that way, of course. We can understand the the logic behind building that. No, system, I do. Least. Yeah, definitely. And I think. And they also saw kind of how, you know, even World of Warcraft and, and games like EVE, how they're, you know, the, the big economy trading type games. And they were like, these games have success with these systems. Mm -hmm. So why can't we build that into our game and amplify the loops? But I just don't think, I think in a weird way, Diablo is a very, sp games that do that Rand roll type thing. You know, even like WoW doesn't do that. Not really. You yeah. know, and most MMOs don't. When it's like trying to get the perfect roll, that becomes such a, integrated part of what you have to do that having a way to hijack that or, or, or shortcut it just cuts the very center of what your what game's entertainment value is. Yeah. I think it's a really fun idea like having the dream of like I'm, I'm going to play this game anyway if I get something really cool that gives me money like I can pay for the game by playing it. That's a really nice dream Yeah. but I think it works a lot better with like skins and Counter-Strike and that kind of thing because it's not something that's going to change your experience. It's just like being cooler. So yeah, do you think that the, the cosmetic aspect of it because you know, we ran a piece uh, just last week about how basically, like, pretty much the in-game economy of selling and buying skins is what made Counter-Strike go as big as it is today. It's the second most popular game on Steam after Dota. Yeah, right. which is, you know, that's a hard number to hit, Dota. It's like, that's that's a high <laughs> bar to hit. Right. Um, so, like, do you think that just the simplicity of just, you know, oh, it's only cosmetic, like... Is it that simple and then the problem is fixed? Well, it, mm -hmm. as a person who, who wrote that article, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> no, it's uh, not that simple. So the, cl the clever thing, I think, I think the first thing I would say, you know, if I was designing one of these systems, I was thinking about economies and skins and, and what can I sort of sell in a, in a way that makes sense. It's, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. No. You can't look at what's happening in the mobile market. You can't look at Dota and just say, well, we'll do that and we'll kind of mutate it a little bit. Uh, what made it work in Counter-Strike was not only that it's fully cosmetic, which is just necessary. I mean, the game has an enormous skill ceiling. Anything that disrupts that would be would result in complete revolt by the player base. Right. And, uh, it, it, absolutely. But they, they built in systems. I mean, okay, how does Counter-Strike work? What's unique to Counter-Strike is what, you die qu pretty quickly, and when you die, you're in a timeout where you get to think about what you did, <laughs> uh, what you did wrong tactically. You went left instead of right. You bought a shotgun instead of an S SMG. Think about what you did. You know, that's, that's purposeful. You, you reflect on that. But what are you doing in that time? You're looking at your teammates mm. through their eyes, and you're looking at, well, th their gun is right in front of you. So that gun in front of you that your teammate or an, an opponent, opponent is holding becomes sort of a, a display case 
becomes sort of like this window shopping experience, right? Where you're, you're going to spend that time anyway looking at what they're holding. So it might as well be something up for sale that you can sort of admire and think, oh, that looks interesting. I, like that's, I've never seen that skin before. That's really rare. Wow. Uh, I'd like to pick that up. So you're spending all this time just looking at those guns anyway. Yeah. And built into Counter-Strike, inherently any competitive player knows this, is you want to pick up the best gun available that's yes, on the ground. On the gun, really. so, yeah, so you're naturally picking up stuff, trying it out, seeing what it looks like. And, you know, that was very intentional. It, it's, it's a seamless part of that system, basically, where it's, it's not just decoration, but it actually feeds into the mechanics in the sense that when you kill somebody and take their gun, now it's a visual trophy in Counter-Strike. Yep. And when you later kill them in a later round with that gun, it's just this amazing insult. But I think what you were just right. hitting on is, is actually, so you were mentioning before just the, mm -hmm. yeah, music in the background, it's good. Um, <laughs> you were mentioning before the, the, is it that simple? And the answer is most certainly not, because Counter-Strike is an excellent, very, very um, incredibly executed product. And it's I mean, 15 years old. Game. They know exactly what they've yeah. built, the balance, the way they're doing their map structure, the way they do their, their loops. I mean, they're just, it's exactly what those players want. So they had, you had to have that kind of crystallized, really, really awesome core loop. The thing that I think, uh, in my opinion, you know, reading the article and kind of thinking it through, I think everything you said is exactly right. The, the way that they added their cosmetic system directly amplifies what the game was structured around. But there's a bigger part to this whole thing. Counter-Strike has no meta loop in and of itself. There's no, back in the, I played Tac Ops, which was the unreal version of Counter-Strike back when they started. And I was, obviously Tac Ops lost in Counter-Strike 1, but they were, for a while, <laughs> Unreal Tournament, Tac Ops was the number one mod of Unreal Tournament, and Counter-Strike was the number, uh, number one mod on the other side. Yeah. And they were the same size for a while. And they, there was no, when I played that game for the year plus, there was nothing to do aside from just play the round. Yeah, no progression. You play the yeah. round, you were done. You played the next round, you were done. You have a clan, you organize clan fights, but that was pretty much it. When they added that into Counter-Strike, it was like just throwing gasoline on a fire. Because the fire was already burning, it was already going. And then they're like, by the way, now you have a goal. <laughs> You're not just sitting there and playing one round. Yeah. When you play for the next three months or whatever, you want to get that special decorated knife either by earning it or trading it or buying it. And now you have a reason to acquire these things and show them off. And that meta, any meta loop on top of Counter-Strike, if it was done well, probably would have been successful. They picked the one at the most powerful strategic point and went, here you go, and it just... Yeah. It was a very smart, very deliberate move. You know, I think what, what's important about theirs as well, that their meta loop really doesn't touch on the gameplay at all. Yes! That's, I think, what really made it with Counter-Strike, because it's so yep. competitive. If they would have made a, like, leveling system where some players would be stronger and some would be weaker, I think that would, that would kill it. Oh, that would kill it. Yeah, yeah that wouldn't it. work. Unless you have, like, very, very intricate systems. But then you're changing the entire gameplay experience. Now you're not touching that. You're just kind of building something mm -hmm. outside of that, which goes, like, bragging rights, fashion, which you mentioned, like, just having fun with that system mm -hmm. without it touching the gameplay, I think was essential to make it work. And I mean, everyone remembers, I mean, I, I don't play actively Counter-Strike, I was never a big Counter-Strike fan, but I mean, nice in the center at the end of the match was like, a, that was a code of honor. <laughs> yeah. It's like, all right, we can just sit here and walk around for the next four minutes, or let's just meet one place and duke it mm -hmm. out with a knife. And the fact that now my knife looks like a dragon hilt, I mean, yeah. that's, that's, <laughs> that's a valuable thing. Yeah. Because everyone's watching that encounter. And me coming in as a new player with my like crappy knife, I'm like, I'm gonna get intimidated and <laughs> I lose. Want that. Oh. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna play 200 hours now. The skin vantage is real. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> any, any, any League of Legends player knows this. So I, I think what we're touching on now and what we discovered is the secret to a good microtransaction system is build a game, let it exist for 15 years without microtransactions. <laughs> And we have to build a game that can exist for 15 years without microtransactions. Step one. And survive. <laughs> yeah. right. And only then. Which is easy, right? Yeah. Every, yeah. every developer can do That's it. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah. 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 No, I <laughs> mean, you're 100% you're right. Years? I think, you know, for us and what we're building with DD2, um, you know, we actually take that philosophy to heart. We, we, we use the term ethical monetization, which we um, borrowed from the Path of Exile guys. Um, but, yeah. you know, our, our monetization at our core, we keep it outside of our loops. So it's cosmetic, it's convenience, like inventory expansion. We don't allow power to be sold. And we do that because of the exact same thing we're talking about right now. You know, in a loot bait, it's similar to like the auction house thing in Diablo. You know, we, we knew or we believe that if we interfere with that progressive loop inside of our game, we'll destroy it. It needs to be protected so that the people that earn, you know, their stats or their cool staff from killing Betsy, like we saw Phil do earlier, that's what he earned. I know he earned that thing. Maybe we add some trade mechanic in later on that has some constraints that friction points allow players to maybe have relationships, but it still needs to be a protected system outside of money. 
um, so, so that then when the money comes in, that's a different step. It's vanity or something else. I don't know how, how familiar you guys are with League of Legends, but Evan, you brought it up. So my question is, why does League of Legends kind of get a pass in its rune system? Obviously, that's a little different because you can't trade runes mm-hmm. and you can't sell runes and runes are not bought for real money. So those are th- like... Real, those are two really huge differences, right? But like, still to a certain degree, and it's a very minor, like, just point fractions of a point in different stats. But like, League of Legends does have a system where you need to earn in-game money to buy power. Yeah. Like, fundamentally, that is what it is. And yes, it's very negligible amounts of power, but it, it seems like they like almost came into the this world of like microtransactions so early that kind of nobody questioned it and i feel like if somebody tried to pull that in a new game nowadays like new pvp game that is nowadays like they'd get called out well i think the the key that you said though though is um the runes themselves are purchased with earned currency yep. not bought currency and mm-hmm. that's the reason why it works if they if, if league were to have, I mean who knows maybe you know 20 years down the road from now they're finally not the most amazing the popular successful game they'll do this but if they sold runes the whole system would have collapsed right know? because then I would and I remember I only played league in the beginning I played in the beta and a little bit beyond that and then I was done um, but I remember playing and being furious like I don't have the rune pages you guys have this <laughs> sucks I mean, maybe I'm losing because I'm not probably was losing because I wasn't as good as they were. But I always sit there going, no, nah, man, it's because they're level 30 and they have all the runes and I'm level 18 and this sucks. <laughs> like, that was just your mentality. But you didn't go, no, they spent to get that. Mm-hmm. They earned it. And that added a lot of a lot of difference into your perception. It was just progressively stronger. To me, runes, I mean, I played a lot of League of Legends. I haven't for a long time, but I've played a lot of League of Legends and I feel like I only ever had one full rune page my entire time playing it. And to me, it almost felt like like learning the, like, stick combos in Street Fighter, right? Yeah. Where, like, the pros, like, that was something the pros were just going to be better at me, th- like, better at than me, and I was just going to have to live with that. Like, I was just going to have to live with the fact that I, w- if unless I was going to try to be a pro player, like, I was not going to have the runes. And it was kind of, like, a bummer to me, but at the same mm-hmm. time, like, I guess the, the, the fact that it was such a negligible amount, like, it was a very small influence. Yeah, that, it's all transparent. They tell you it's, like, 0.1% or a two, yeah. 2% gain of it's different small. stats. But, I mean, also, like, pro players will argue over what the best rune pages are for, you know, each champion in each search, search, yeah, situation. Excuse mm-hmm. me. My yeah, words are fighting me today. That's all right. I think a part of it is also that it's a lifestyle game. Like, like we kind of touched on before. Yeah. We yeah. were always playing it. It gets to that point where, like, if you're playing League of Legends and you haven't spent like 100 hours already, mm-hmm. chances are that you're not gonna have all the runes and whatever, but once you get to that point, I think for me personally, like I played a ton of League of Legends way back. Whenever I play it now, I don't even look at my rune pages, it's like, yeah, I've got runes. <laughs> <That's sort of laughs> yeah. I set them up a couple years ago. Yeah, exactly, they sure. probably still work. I'm sure if I got dust on them, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny too, because you know, you look at games like World of Tanks and how they have evolved over time. Yeah. You know, in the very beginnings of World of Tanks, they had golden ammo, for goodness sake. It's like, I spend money to shoot better than you can. And that got removed, yeah. you know, and that made them money. But they sat there and looked at them. I'm sure there was a lot of data that went into it. And they're going, we will make more money if we remove some of these clear, like, definitive pay-to-win type mechanics and instead allow them. I mean, they have a lot of time acceleration. You know, you can sit there and buy your way through a, a skill tree of something if you really want to. Mm-hmm. But it's still earnable and it's even at the end of the day for the mm-hmm. most part. Right. Um, once you added that advantage, like, that, that purposeful advantage, um, you know, and it's really it's what's ironic about all of this though is that I'm you know Star Conflict doesn't have necessarily golden ammo, but they do have a lot of you know pay for power type mechanics, and for some reason it doesn't bother me. And I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I've spent a lot of money in the game, embarrassingly. But I just that's why love, it doesn't bother you. <laughs> maybe, but I just I love playing the game. Like I love the core game so much that I just really don't care. There's no game like it right now that really tickles what I want to play, and maybe that's why I give it kind of a pass. Um, but I think that you know when it comes to you know compet- like hard competitive games like MOBAs or you know Counter Strike or whatever, there's just zero tolerance. I mean, just yeah. zero tolerance. Yeah, you well, have to separate that like in- intrinsic track of reward of I'm getting better and I can feel myself getting better or worse, and that there's an experience in that of I'm seeing my development as a player. I'm better at headshots. I'm better at sniping. I'm better at jungling or whatever. Yeah. And the extrinsic stuff, which is I'm earning these sort of you know, cosmetic rewards or, you know, other related stuff. And I love, co- I mean, I, I spent a good amount of money in Smite, too. I love cosmetics. Oh, Smite yeah. was my MOBA. I love playing Smite. I played it for almost a little over a year. And, uh, I mean, every time, a, every time a new hero came out, 
if I played them and liked them, I immediately bought the voice pack and all the costumes. Like, that was just not even a hesitation. I'm like, I'm going to look cool when I play this guy. I'm not going to waste time looking like a scrub. I want to look, I want to look pretty awesome. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a status symbol in a way. It really I, is. I think it, it applies to MOBAs and the Counter-Strike as well. It, it, it says something about you as a player. I'm committed to this character. I've been playing for this long. And, and not only that, I have the means to acquire this thing uh, because I'm so serious about this game or this, this role. Yeah. You know? I remember there was that game, uh, I don't know if that's still going, like Entropia, where you could like buy real locations. I remember somebody bought an island for no, like... No, and they built, no, they bought a, um, you're talking about the moon or the satellite. The oh. it, well, yeah, if you're talking about the same game, it was one where they bought, he, uh, he did like a real estate deal to, to the developers to build this space station that he was going to sell condo space for. Um, it was like a million dollar deal. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I love reading about games like that. <laughs> I don't know if I'd play them, but... Yeah. Uh, I don't think it worked out. One. I don't know how well it worked out. No idea. Yeah. It can just that. appear up the news. I remember that, though. That's crazy. Well, let's move on to this week's Cat Fantastic Quiz. Mm. Um, for those of you who don't know, and for our guests joining us, every week we do a themed quiz, just kind of about something in PC gaming, even loosely. Um, <laughs> We try to keep it light and, and fun, and as someone in the Twitch chat said that I, I have to steal this uh, because you are here with Vermintide, it will be, I guess, the Rat Fantastic quiz this week. Um, yes. Not that Jeez. Cat Fantastic means anything anyway, <laughs> but we can just move on. You guys, Wherever you are, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys see that rat pulling the pizza down the stairs in New York? Really good. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> really good. That was rat-tastic. I like, <laughs> I like to pretend that he's bringing it down to his Ninja Turtles, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Feed his family. Oh, oh my God, Splinter! I mean, they're in New York. Now you're just making me sad. Now That's I'm just like clever. imagining the Splinter scene where he's he's dying in the movie. Oh, the, yeah, I know. This is where. Yeah. We're, Should we take a break? No. <laughs> yeah. Ask I'll, us some dumb okay. trivia questions. So yeah. this week, last week we did a name game with Dirty Bomb and Rocket League. The questions were, uh, you can go back and watch it on YouTube or on the podcast or wherever you'd like. You know. Is this a car from Rocket League or is it a character name from Dirty Bomb? <laughs> and it was really hard. This week, surprisingly uh, tough. We have a similar one thought up by our very own staff writer Chris Livingston, um, who helped me out with the funnies because I don't think anybody does them better than him. So, which series is this character from? Oh no, Borderlands or Mad Max? Oh no, and this will be the entire Borderlands series and the entire Mad Max film and it's game. It's like the series. same genre. Well. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, right. So I'm going to name a character, and you're going to have to tell me, is it from the Borderlands series, or is it from the Mad Max series? And bonus points if you can actually say which one. Gosh. Well, let's jump right into it, because we got a, good, a lot of good ones. So first off, our first character, Motorhead. Jeez. It's going to yeah. be Borderlands, isn't it? Just, but Mad Max is all about cars. Yeah. <laughs> it's a trick question. I'm going to say Mad Max. I'll say Borderlands, too. It was Borderlands. That yeah. was the trick one, yeah. That was the, that was the trick there. So next we have Screw Loose. Spelled S C R O S E R O O loose, all one word. Screw loose. Wow, I have just. I'm gonna say Mad Max. I played Borderlands one and two. I didn't play any of the extra ones. You guys played about ten minutes of Borderlands. (laughs) (laughs) You guys see the Mad Max movie? Yeah, Yeah, I saw the new Mad Max movie, and I saw one of the old ones when I was like a kid. I don't really remember anything of it. I know like weird. Aside from really fast cars and a lot of violence, I remember that. I know weird, weird names are are a thing in that movie, so I'll I'll say Mad Max too. Mad Max. I'm gonna say with Mad Max too. All right, that is right. That was Beyond Thunderdome. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Next, One-Eyed Jack. That's Borderlands. Borderlands. Dang. Okay. Apparently, I shouldn't have included One-Eyed Jack. Yeah. (laughs) Moving on. Flesh stick. <laughs> what? What is that actually? I don't even. What's the reference? Is, that's not okay. It's oh. two words, and it is a name. All right. I'll, I'll say Borderlands just to get this out of the way. <laughs> Borderlands. Gosh. I'm gonna go Mad Max just to be contrarian. Now that was Borderlands Two, uh, in fact. Uh, flesh stick. The Bullet Farmer. Mad Max. Oh. I've seen it three times because I. I keep, <laughs> it's, it's an old airplane. Like. <laughs> All right, I'm trusting him then. Mad Max. Yeah, I haven't heard I want to change my... I'm sorry. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't heard that in Borderlands, so yeah. Okay, yeah, that was Fury Road. That was the, the, the guy who runs Guntown or whatever in Fury oh, Road. Oh, right. Um, Incinerator Clayton. Oh, well. Incinerator Clayton? That's, I'm going to go Borderlands. It sounds like a Borderlands one. boss, actually. Yeah, yeah. I would say Mad Max, just because, you know... <laughs> Someone has to. Yeah, there's got to be the there's guy. There's that guy with the guitar. That would be a great name for him. Isn't his name like Doof Warrior or something? <laughs> doesn't in, sound cool at all. He was my favorite. No, 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 no in Mad Max, Max. Uh, the guy with the flaming flamethrower guitar. Oh, so cool. I don't know what his actual that name is. That was my favorite in. character in the entire. I'm sorry, yeah. but he just he never. I love when he's asleep, 
I like yeah. wake him up and he just like, <laughs> like just immediately goes back to playing. Yeah. Not even like a moment's hesitation. I read a story about does. him. I guess he's an actual musician in Australia too. Yeah. Just anyway, he's not just a crazy person who. Well, he's is not like, actually with a flaming. He's guitar. not like an actor. <laughs> he was actually, he was a working guitar. Uh, yeah. Well, Incinerator Clayton is Borderlands Two. Mm-hmm. Um, next, Doctor Deal Good. Say Borderlands. Borderlands has a Doctor Zed. Mm, mm-hmm. So I'll say Mad Max. I'm gonna go with Mad Max. That was Mad Max. That was also Beyond Thunderdome. But I thought that was another good one that could have been like mm-hmm. a weird Borderlands character. Thanks. Thanks for the support. <laughs> <laughs> Commandant Steel. Oh. Ooh. I'll say Mad Max. Yep. Yeah, Mad I'm Max. gonna say Mad Max as well. Military ranks. That's Borderlands oh, one. Whoa. In fact, really? yeah. Um, I'm I'm proud of that one too. Uh, <laughs> Tauntaun Tattoo. Is that like a Star Wars reference? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, okay, it's spelled T-O-N space okay. T-O-N. So it might be Tun Tun Tattoo. I'm not sure, but that is the name. It sounds vaguely Australian, so I'll, I'll go with Mad Max. I like that logic. I like that <laughs> reasoning. Yeah, I like that logic, too. I'm going to go Mad Max. Let's do it. That was Mad Beyond Max. Thunderdome. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Beyond Thunderdome finally, was my favorite movie. our last one, Toe Cutter. Toe Cutter? Toe Cutter. I don't know. It's hmm. tricky. I'm going to go with Borderlands. Yeah, I'm going to go Borderlands. Borderlands. That one was Mad Max. Oh. And that was actually a trickiest one, I think, in here, because that was the original Mad Max oh, that was in Australia. One? The Mad Max 2 came out as Road Warrior mm-hmm. in the States. But the original Mad Max, I don't think, ever got an official release in the U.S. I might be wrong about that. But Toe Cutter, there's also a Nine Toes from Borderlands. There's a character named Nine Toes, so I thought that might be. Yeah, might that, be that was the one we were yeah, thinking, right, guys? Was, <laughs> was, it was. Because he cut his toe off or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so crazy, crazy psychos uh, and post apocalyptic people. I guess those two worlds, we should see a crossover game. There should be Borderlands yeah. DLC for Mad Max or the other way around, I guess. You know, so Matterlands. F- what's yeah. so funny about this whole quiz is that just a couple of days ago, I don't, you know, got lost in the internet and ended up on. Wikipedia reading up on all the Mad Max movies. I don't know why. And I was like watching all the old trailers from back in the 80s just because I was just curious. And if I had been paying more attention, maybe I would have had better references. I just remember watching all of those just a couple days ago. You know, it, it makes me think, actually, I think we've all kind of been surprised by how good Tales from the Borderlands is, the, the Telltale series. I still haven't played it. I really want it's, to. It's surprisingly funny and well-written. It's, yeah. it's, it's really great. But, man, Mad Max would perhaps be an even better take mm-hmm. for Telltale to do because I mean the movie as, as amazing as it was the action sequences definitely lend themselves to QTE type encounters you're just mashing buttons and jumping on cars and doing stuff like well, that that's and true yeah, yeah some good dramatic stories to be told in that universe <laughs> well let's move right along I hope you guys enjoyed that quiz that was once again Chris Livingston's idea he Disgusting. came up with he came up with a couple <laughs> others uh, that I am excited to share with you guys uh, I guess not our special guest maybe maybe one day but Evan, uh, he came up with a great TF2 one that we'll see oh hopefully boy. next week. Ooh. Oh, boy. Um, moving right along, though, let's go to uh, a discussion about I want to talk a little bit about video game books and video game novels and comics yeah. and whatever. Uh, first, just to get a little background, have you guys, have you guys read video game novels or are oh, you yeah. into those? No. Not very many, but, but a few. Um, they surprised me. So I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty prolific reader, uh, especially of sci-fi and fantasy. I'm a huge sci-fi fan, big military sci-fi fan. Um, and I, you know, a, lo- a number of years ago, like 10 years, eight years ago, I had to make a decision on entertainment. I'm like, all right, there's movies, there's TV, there's books, and there's video games, and I can't do all of them. And so movies and TV are the ones that dropped off. I still watch TV every once in a while, like Netflix, but gaming and books is what I really focus on. Cool. So I love reading. Well, last week uh, it was announced that XCOM 2 was going to be getting a book called XCOM 2 Resurrection. Yeah. Um, and it was going to be a novel that basically filled in the gaps between the first game and the second game, saying Enemy Within never happened. Um, we'll basically pretend that the expansion to XCOM, 2, to XCOM 1, Enemy Unknown, just didn't exist. Mm. And the humans lost. And that's what this book is going to go over. And I wanted to ask, and obviously this is also a good topic to bring up with you, because Warhammer mm-hmm. in yeah. general is, you know, Warhammer has a... Olympic-sized swimming pool full of books that it can pull from and source from. Oh, yes. Um, I don't even know where I would start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the the End Times is an event that's going yeah. on right now in that world. Exactly. Um, but, like, so what I wanted to ask about is, like, how do you guys feel about story, like, not be like being told through book instead of game? 
because Overwatch is going to be doing this as well. Overwatch was announced they're going to have a graphic novel series that talks about the old Overwatch organization set, you know, 20 years before the game. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys feel about, like... It's like externalized narrative. Exactly, yeah. 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 Like, story that the developers maybe want to tell and just can't fit into the game. I think, like anything, it all depends on the quality bar because Mm. I've read um, some of the game tie-in books and they're just kind of eh. And it actually kind of takes away from the franchise. And then I remember, um, it's actually a sad ending in my opinion, but the, the Hellgate London books, um, the first two were just awesome. <laughs> like they were so damn good. And you're reading it and you're going, I, Hellgate London was a bad game, right? I really want to play it. <laughs> like you were, you were reading the books and going, I'm going to, I, I actually went and I'm, I'm re- going to do it. I did. <laughs> I'm going to download it. I reinstalled it. <laughs> I, I, I got the second book. I wow. reinstalled the game and started playing again. I was like, no, it's not like the books. It's not a good game. But I mean, it was like the books really. In the third book, I think that they decided to cut the contract, and so he didn't. He had to wrap everything up. And the third book is not as good. But the first two are really, really good. That's the first time I've ever heard anyone say this game is not as good as the book. Exactly. Oh, I'm kind of let down. Yeah, <laughs> no, the book. The first two books. Were, I mean, it was such a cool story about the paladins and what they were trying to do, and like the characters in there and all the things. And you're like, were these characters in the game? I don't remember that. I want to go find out. Uh, it was just very pulling and very engaging. And I remember also reading, um, I was a big Wing Commander fan back in the day, oh, I mean, obviously, right? And I read all of the Wing Commander books, or four of them, I believe, four or five of them. And the, the interesting thing is that in the, uh, you know, they had some really high tier authors, like Mercedes Lackley, who everyone knows, a big fantasy author. She wrote one of the Wing Commander books. Oh, cool. And uh, uh, something Forsyth, I think his name is Thomas Forsyth, or uh, Forsh or whatever. He also wrote one. He's gone on to be a very famous um, fantasy and, and sci-fi author. And they had a book series they wrote that came, was timed before Wing Commander 3. And in it, um, some of the characters that are in Wing Commander 3 are actually good characters. Like, you're rooting for them and really happy for them. And they're, they're like, very, like, the Admiral Tolan or whatever his name is, he's a hero figure in this book. Hmm. And you're, like, you go to this whole book with him and this captain of this ship, and you're, like, man, I love these guys. Hmm. And then I think Chris Roberts, whoever, wrote the script for Wing Commander 3 and made him an enemy, like yeah. a bad guy. And they're, like, well, shit. <laughs> now we have to change this whole per- so like they tried to retro it into the next book that was written around Wing Commander three to now Tolan's this hot headed jerk and like and you're you're reading it going, what happened? Like this guy was our hero and now he's an oh man. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's it's it can be it definitely pulled me deeper into the Wing Commander franchise for mm. sure. Well, books I feel like books of not just from video games have always kind of filled that like had that role of like they don't like people don't mind just shoving them aside. Like, the whole, with the announcement of Star Wars Episode Seven, the entire, nearly the entire extended universe of Star Wars books was just like, oh, that's not canon anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that's something that that happens often, is like, the people will want to tell stories through novel, because it is a, a form that, you know, is very different than game, and can you can tell stories that you can't tell in games to a certain degree, and then like, but they still treat them kind of like secondhand citizens almost. Yeah, it really. De- I mean, I think a lot of that depends on the on the franchise and the media, right? Mm-hmm. Like Star Wars let their narrative go all over the map, so who, they, there was no way to make sense of any of the things that they were doing in this in the in the book series. Yeah, so like meh. Yeah, probably tricky. Mulligan, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll just I mean, non-canonize it. Yeah. Like the first time that I actually read a game novel was I walked into a, a shop in, in Stockholm, and it was a, it's like science fiction bookshop. It's a really cool place. And I walk in, I see these, like, that was when the Diablo Archive came out, I think, which is like four different novels in one. Oh, I never and read that. I'd never heard of it. I was just like, I was looking at it. I was saying, I love Diablo. <laughs> but I'm never going to read this. <laughs> I kind of just walked around. I was looking, and I was just about to leave the shop. And the Diablo theme came on, like in the shop. I was like, I just turned right around, just bought it. It's went a home. sign. It's yeah, a it was sign. just meant to be. Like, oh, someone in marketing is yeah. going, yes. Exactly. <laughs> they they saw me. Like, no, but but it was fun because I think those books, at least the first one in particular, which is one I remember the most, was very much kind of telling a story from a very different perspective. So they weren't including like the main characters mm-hmm. from the game. It was more kind of you have these side characters that are telling their own story. And so when I was playing Diablo later, I was like, I recognize that name of this like random little character that I'd never thought about before because I killed him a thousand times and he just never mattered. Yeah. Now he matters, now he has a backstory. Well, you know, the Mass Effect games actually, I think did a very good job of keeping continuity that supported the product because they were, yeah. you know, those guys, they were purposely creating a franchise. It's like, oh, we don't care. We are making a franchise and that's the way it's gonna be. And when they wrote those books, they were very smart about making them 
very long periods of time before the game, but around, and around characters that weren't central characters, they're kind of like second or third tier tier characters, but you gave them enough backstory that when you ran into them, I mean, uh, the, I think the first Mass Effect novels came out after Mass Effect 1 release, it was between 1 and 2, and it was about, um, uh, was the it was one of the admirals I think that was in the as in the Citadel. He doesn't do anything in the second game except for just sit in the Citadel. But the whole book is written about him when he was a specter. Hmm. And like the first three books are all about his story. And you're just going, I mean, now I know this guy. Yeah. Like I've seen the stuff he's gone through. I seen what specters did back then. And it's a very cool table setting. I think that's the great part is when you can, now you can go to the Citadel and kind of look at that guy and go, man, I, I know what you've been through, bro. Like, right, right. <laughs> there, and they were really smart and clever about the the dialogue because he would lace. I mean, it didn't sound like you were missing something if you hadn't read the books, but there were words that he would use yeah. that you were just like, yeah, I know what you're talking exactly. about. I've nice. been, yeah, it was really well I mean, done. I mean, Bioware is definitely world class, that kind of stuff. Obviously, they naturally have a fan base that wants story, and mm-hmm. they're going to build that extra, you know, elements of fringe storytelling. Uh, but I think it's an especially effective tool for multiplayer games as well. I mean... There have been Borderlands comics. I'm trying to think of other examples, but TF2 is is really the the world class example. Yeah, I think you look at the game in general, why it's successful, why it's been able to stick around for eight years, and you say, well, they've found a way to tell a story outside of the game, and reflect that back into the game with the way items are implemented with these mm-hmm. like in game events, where they're not just patches, they're you know crazy happenings in this blood feud between two families that are like each has a different color that they represent and different mercenary group and it's it's a really economical way of getting people invested in that game right because if you're talking about how do i put exposition into a yeah. a death match mm-hmm. like how you do that how do like, you even you know go about that like at, at most you can just do characterization yeah, where yeah. you have uh dialogue and quips and stuff like that or observations or you know, in a, in a PvE game, you can have, like, you know, the story of going from point A to point B. You can have some sort of incidental storytelling with the environment and whatnot. Yeah. But it, it's really clever. I mean, they, they've they've found ways to... I mean, people are as passionate about TF2, I think, as, as any game out there in terms of the lore. And that's, that's a huge achievement. That's so hard to do in a shooter, in a multiplayer shooter especially. And that's something that I actually touched on a little bit when I talked about uh, Overwatch's story and how excited I was for... How I was more excited, essentially, for Overwatch's story and its world building than I was for its actual gameplay. Yeah. Um, to a certain degree. Not, that, not to disparage the gameplay at all. It still looks fun. Oh, sure. It's just that I, their world they're building is incredibly interesting to me. I think um, there's also like a stickiness that gets built in, in a sense, because, like, so for example, for me, I... I don't really, I uh, played a little bit of the fantasy Warhammer, I played a lot more Warhammer 40k, and my first Warhammer 40k experience was Dawn of War. That's really my, my intro, it was my, yeah. my gateway drug, so to speak. And then I'm like, this is really cool, like I like yeah. I like this, giant space marines, and I mean this is fun, I knew I could do a little bit of the story of the blizzard hole, whatever shenanigans that happened there. Um, <laughs> but then I'm like at the store, bookstore, and I'm going, Jesus, there's a lot of freaking yeah. Warhammer 40k books. And so I picked up one, and it was the most brutal, visceral, darkest stuff I've ever read. And I've read a lot. Yeah. Like, nothing that dark. And I'm going, oh, man. And then I've read, like, 40 of them now. I've just I've consumed Warhammer 40k. So then now, when new games come out, even if they're bad, and some of them are not that great, I'm still like, yeah, I'm still going to pick this up and play it. It's a, it's a 40k game. Like, I just, I'm, I'm a Warhammer guy. But, the, but at the same time... The, you know, you'll have a really good response to this, I think. We, we ran an article a few weeks ago talking about the, how cr- the Space Marines, the Warhammer 40K Space Marines are, in our opinion, is like an editorial, the only Space Marines. Like, they're, they're the best Space Marines <laughs> because they're so bizarre. Yes. And, it's, and you don't necessarily get that knowledge and that impression playing them through games because a lot no. of that stuff gets filtered out yes. so that they can sort of so that uh, the average player can sort of see them as an American Marine almost, you know what I mean? Like uh, the space equivalent of that. Yeah. But actually, it turns out they have multiple hearts inside their body. Man, it turns out they eat brains to consume memories because yeah. they, they have a special gland called the, what the is it? The, re- cord, yeah, the remem- gland remembrancer. Or, yeah. Uh, to retain. Oh, you're talking about the mystical ones. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I get all their various anatomy confused. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what else? I mean, uh, just what, what I love about the 40. And I mean, and I'm sure I need to get. I haven't died. They, the they spit yet, acid. Is that right? They can. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a subset of one of the chapters that has Great. acid, has like an acid gland in their mouth that they can spit. Great. But they like, they're you read or you talk like sometimes you're like pushing edges and like how do you make things more? There is no one that does that better than the Warhammer. They, like, just those authors have no gumption. They have no limits. They will say and write anything yep. at the extreme levels. And what's crazy, it's somehow 
the Black Library guys at the Games Workshop can keep it all to make sense. Like, it doesn't break the franchise. And they go on these crazy directions, and they can like, no, it all makes sense. It all works. And I, that is the definition of a franchise, in my opinion. That robust. <laughs> I love it. I mean, there's just, oh. And to a certain extent, we're seeing that kind of buildup of lore exploding into video games right now. We talked about this on the show before, where it's like, there's like over a dozen different Warhammer IPs coming out yeah. right now. Like there are there are there are Warhammer games, excuse me. Like there's like so many Warhammer 40k games, Warhammer like medieval games, like there's everything. It just like all of those stories that they have built up are like starting to spill out yeah. into games. Well, what's funny is I think that in, in in Black Library's case, they always had success. Like there was always a good turnover on their books. When the Horus Heresy stuff started, they went like this. Mm-hmm. Like it was, yeah, we're making money. Yeah, we're making money. Oh my lord! Now we're on the New York Times bestselling list. Like the Horus Heresy books just broke the bank. And so now they're like, man, we gotta like. There's a lot of people that now want this content. Let's mm-hmm. see what we can do with it. I and mean, I love it because I'm geeking out over all of it. Yeah. But it's really interesting to watch. And I think like talking about the, the amount of games that are coming out now. If you look at the Warhammer world and just like how much, just lore and the world and the characters and history, there's so much to take from to build a game. I think it's 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 just good to see a lot more games coming out. <laughs> the and crazy part though, and this is the, your comment. No one, no one has been brave enough to do it, and I don't know if I would be. None of the games have gone as far as the books go. Not even close. Like, mm. they're like the Candyland version of Warhammer, and I'm not exaggerating. Like, even the most darkest, most crazy things you've seen in a game is nowhere close to where Warhammer actually goes. But that's also not something that is necessarily unique to how video games interpret books. That's like, true. movies and TV oh, shows oh, yeah, never yeah. go as far as books do. Like, books mm. kind of, to a certain degree, have this, like freedom to just like that other media doesn't yeah. that they yeah. just go crazy books and, and comics and, yeah and anime sometimes yeah <laughs> anime seems to like not care sometimes so, so liam people eating people whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good so liam knowing that you're you're building a warhammer game yeah. uh like what are some of the, the weirder elements of lore that you guys are representing yeah. in vermintide i know like i can't remember the name of it but there's this crazy moon that has all this weird green moon that has like this yeah. myth behind it it has strange properties and effects yeah, so the moon is, is more sleep, and it's this, like, big green wax moon. It's kind of empowering the Skaven race, which is these rat men. Right. So they're obsessed with something called Warpstone, and they're, like, it, it just, it's like their drug, basically. And it's this, like, chaos energy, which you might know a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, but basically what we're trying to do is, like, because we're setting it in the end times, and because the end times is, I guess the end times are pretty much over now in terms of the books, and that kind of came and went, but we're setting it in the beginning of the end times just to kind of tell that story from a different perspective. But for us, it's just, like, as we were talking about, it's a dark world. You can do a lot of really crazy stuff in it. So I think it's bringing in the Skaven is, is really what we're focusing on. And mm-hmm. That must to, be so much fun. Yeah. I mean, it's great. As a developer, like, I just, that must be so much fun. It's a great race to work with as well because yeah. they get to be the star of the game. And we can do crazy stuff with them that you wouldn't be able to do with zombies. And They're more expressive. Yeah. I mean, for one thing, that's, that's something that's really struck me about Vermintide that they, well, for one thing, they flee sometimes. Uh, yeah. You know, that's when you outnumber them, I guess, is, is how the AI works. That's the idea. Like, mm-hmm. if you walk up to a group of Skaven and they see you and they're like, we're probably not going to be able to take you right now, they're just kind of backing off. And it's it's funny, some of our initial feedback when we had that and we had some play tests was like, people didn't want to kill them. They felt bad about killing them. <laughs> like, they've just completely they overrun the city. <laughs> but yeah, they gave up. <laughs> so it's good. But but I think, um, in particular for us, having worked with some of the writers behind mm. like the lore, having had that connection with Games Workshop and being able to bring out that kind of that depth of the Warhammer lore, but bringing it into an action game has been really fun for us. But, I mean, it's, in the case of Vermintide, the story does take a backseat a little bit. It's more there for, like, the hardcore audience. We're trying to make just a great co-op action game, so if you've never even heard of Warhammer, you're still supposed to be able to go in and have a good time. But, like, if you know everything about Warhammer, you might get some of those, like, Admiral in the Citadel type moments where it's like, I know who you are, or, like... You know, just understanding subtle things here and there. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and you, you guys were talking about, like like you said, you were talking about that with Mass Effect, yeah. the, you know, having the books do that, and, like, Diablo and that sort of stuff. Yeah, one of the, like, fun comments we got on our forums during the, you know, running the, like, really small betas was somebody said, there's a quote that one of the characters says to another, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, but uh, <laughs> they're saying, is this referencing to something going on over here? And we just, like, maybe. <laughs> that, that would be interesting. You know, That's one of the comments I'll make on this topic that I think is another curious curiosity that... I've never read it yet, so I don't know how it turned out, and I don't think they're doing more with it, was Eve's um, experiment, where they were trying to take stories from the game and wrap that into a novel form. Yeah. And I still haven't picked it I don't know, and it's it's curious to me that I haven't picked it up, because I feel like I should want to, and I, I don't know why I've hesitated. Um, but that's a really interesting idea, which is the players are creating narrative. 
by how they're interacting with each other as the history of Eve is evolving. And, and Eve is trying to find authors that will capture the player's own narrative and turn it into something that could mm. be as a book form. That's a super cool idea. Really cool. And it's done. I mean, there's, there's yeah. the first novel that's called Empyrean, I think, or something like that. Mm. Um, I could be getting the name wrong. Someone on the stream will probably know. Um, <laughs> but it's a really, really cool, exciting idea because Eve's universe is so organic. Yeah. There's so much history that exists there because of all of the wars that have happened and the betrayals. And, you know, they're like, you know, the, you know why don't we write a story about that <laughs> one corporation who took everyone's money? And just ran. Yeah, like that actually happened, and he screwed a whole bunch of people over. That could be a really compelling narrative. I mean, yeah. I think games like Eve and, and Daisy as well, to mm. usually is like they popularized being a player and kind of telling your own story. It's like the, I don't know what the story of Daisy is. I have no idea, but I know my stories from it, and that's kind of a fun thing to do with a game where like you can have a story outside of it. No, you can bring a right. perspective to it, but you coming out of the game, you should have your own story to tell. You know, one thing be the I, hero yourself. One thing that I've always thought of, and um, you know, sometimes when you're playing games like Civilization and you're going through, you're always like, man, what would it be like to be just a dude in my civilization or a family? <laughs> like, what would their story be? Because, like, we were at war with these guys for, like, a thousand years fighting with the Byzantines and, like, massacres of cities and everything, and your little farmer is just like, oh, my God, we're going to be in war for forever. <laughs> this king is great. Like, there was a, there's a whole narrative that happens organically with the mechanics that exist in some of these games. So, so the feature we're looking for is procedurally generated stories based on your gameplay and oh, civilization. Okay. That Make it happen. <laughs> no that no would problem. Be fun. That would no be problem. Fun. I mean, there's there's plenty of research happening right now about you know robots writing news and r robots writing books as well. Oh so. man, Dwarf, Dwarf <laughs> Fortress has that to a certain it's degree, doesn't it? It's conceivable. Yeah. Doesn't Dwarf Fortress have like poetry like, or something? It, yeah, it like builds yeah. the world, like the lore oh, of the yes, world, yes, and yes, then yes, like yes. the poetry comes out. Like yeah, it does that to a certain degree. I gave up so quickly in Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, I it seems like the best game ever, but I just I don't understand. But you can read stories about. I mean, that's like cool. yeah, actually exactly. com, like the com Dwarf Fortress stories yeah. are are fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've read some of those. There's like a couple of like blog type posts that is like here is the history of my Dwarf Fortress. And you're reading it going, this is a what does this game look like? And you yeah. look at it and you're going. I yeah. don't understand. How does yeah. these equate? What I, uh, was that, like, the Civilization game that had been going on for 10 years or something? Oh, oh no, right. Civ 2. Civ 2. Yeah. Right. Civ yeah. 2. Someone had a game they've been going on for, like, an, a, yeah, for 10 years. That was incredible. Nuclear too. wasteland. Yeah. Well, like yeah, the Viking well, race. Uh -huh. No, he had gotten to the point where, like, the two powers had been mutually annihilating each other, where they were just, like, completely in a stalemate. And, like, no one, it was like an AI was playing each other at this point. And, like, no one was able to subvert the other. So it was just infinitely going, it was like the infinite war. It never yeah. ended. That's incredible. And I think part of like the value with that story is you could write that and it would be, oh, okay. But when that happens just organically yes. through mm -hmm. the game features, it's yeah. like going back to what we were talking about earlier. Was yes. like if you give the players these features, they'll make it happen. Yeah, you give themselves the tools. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, very, totally. A very Sid Meier-esque. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he wrote a paper, I think he did a couple talks about that. You know, like one of the keys of his philosophy of game. I, I love Sid Meier. I study him a lot. Um, one mm -hmm. of his keys is to create not systems that... Um, control what the player is doing, but different systems that they can use to create their own mm -hmm. game experience. Mm -hmm. You know, let them create the game. You just give them the tools with which to do that. And if you look at his games, he does that all the time. He's a master at that. Yeah. Well, let's move on. That was kind of an amazing conversation. I'm really glad that you were into game novels because that uh, that was a shot in the dark a little bit, and I'm I'm glad we we talked we about had those. some good overlap in our Venn diagram with Warhammer, and that's yeah, great. Indeed, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, so moving on, let's talk about uh, games that are upcoming. We released a, a piece a little, like, last week, or beginning of this week, one of the two, um, about the upcoming games for this autumn. You know, next games that are coming out in the next few months uh, because fall starts tomorrow officially. Mm -hmm. Um, not in San Francisco, though, as we mentioned. <laughs> yes, not in San Francisco. <laughs> it, it, early access. It, <laughs> early access. Early access fall. To give, fall. To, give, to give you guys just listening a, a, an so idea. So that mean that summer was, yesterday was a bug? Was yeah. that it? Yeah, yesterday basically. Was a bug. It was a bug. The last, like, the last like week or so has been like 90-ish yeah. in the Bay, and then today it was just like 70. And then tomorrow and for the next week it's going to be 80, high 80s again. So, I stepped outside the hotel today and I'm like, should I have gotten my other jacket? Like, yeah. it was it was like it was so hot yesterday. What's going on? Today today is weird weather, but it's preparing for fall. That's what I'm saying. Mm. So, let's take a look at uh, some of the games that are coming out. Obviously, and just what we're excited for coming up. Um, obviously, Dungeon Defenders Two and Warhammer End Times Roman Tide are not coming out immediately, but we you guys I assume are excited for those upcoming games. Yeah. So pretty excited. Pretty excited. <laughs> Um, so looking at it, we have Soma. Three games came out today, actually. Soma, FIFA 16, and Blood Bowl 2. 
Um, Blood, Bowl. Blood Bowl two actually that's kind of a Warhammer aspired yeah. it it is yeah. you try that it is a it's a Games Workshop board game correct mm-hmm. yep um, and then Flame in the Flood is coming out in two days which are coming out in early access I guess in two days which was the Kickstarter game um, NBA two K sixteen so we have a lot of sports games coming out right yeah. now um, I don't know are you, are you guys sports games fans like I uh, I played a lot of racing games back in the day. Um, I love like the old Need for Speed games and mm. you know Sega Rally for Criterion, right? Like I was an oh, I was boy. a oh my gosh the Burnout games mm-hmm. like Criterion was I I love what Paradise is a perfect game yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, I think I own Paradise on PC and PS3 just because it's like, I I just wanted to play it when I didn't yeah. have my PS3 once and I was like I'm buying this game again. I also love I loved three and Burnout too. Like three the, the whole AfterTouch system was just ingenious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean I loved a lot of the racing games. I liked a lot of the 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 snowboarding games. Mm-hmm. Um, never really got into like FIFA and I played, I played NBA Jam, if that counts. Yeah, and I bought MLB The Show a couple times, but um, never really got into yeah. it. We're still waiting for our hockey game, Evan. I know. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's sad. But uh, November 11th is the big date on our calendar, right? We're talking uh, talking about, is that the right date? Uh, November, well, we have, real quick, we have Sword Coast Legends also coming out on December 29th. That got delayed, actually. Oh, today. right. That got delayed like three weeks, yeah. I believe. So. Got to update our, our thing. Hmm. Uh, Civilization Beyond Earth yes. is Rising Tide. Expansion is coming out on October I'm 9th. I'm excited that, you know, in the Civ series, that's kind of their MO now. Is that When Civ Five came out, it was great, but it wasn't done yet. Yeah. And then, like, by the time Gods and Kings and Brave New World came out, that was, like, in my yeah. opinion, I think Civ Five with all of its expansions, is the best Civ. Hmm. Uh, I, and I know that's going to be sacrilege to some of the Civ 2 <laughs> fans out there. I think, it's, I think that a I lot loved, of people would agree with you. I loved it. Like, it was so deep. And I'm really, really hoping that, you know, with uh, with the expansions of Relations of Beyond Earth, we'll get a similar kind of increase in quality. Because I wasn't, I liked Beyond Earth, but it just didn't do it for me. So I'm, I'm really, like, holding on. I want it to be yeah. good. The, I the, agree. The theme was a little bit heavy, but I also appreciated that Civilization was kind of exploring some, so, like, modern social issues, if yeah. I can put it that way. I mean, we can have a discussion about not wanting politics in games, but the game is about, like, humanity's survival after this mm-hmm. catastrophe, you know, catastrophic event. And now, seemingly, it's about global warming. <laughs> Maybe no. rising tide. Uh, I mean, Alpha Centauri did a little bit of that, honestly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I had a lot of Alpha Centauri games where you like you felt like the scum of the earth because you're like, no, I'm killing Deidre. I don't care. Like the trees must die, and that was and, just what you felt. And, and yeah. to be fair, the first Beyond Earth's base game is really about global warming because the mm-hmm. whole plot of why they have to leave Earth is mm-hmm. that the sea levels are rising and the world is like going to hell. It's that left way. kind of ambiguous, but yeah. Well, maybe. you can read between um, the, the cutscene yeah. had a little bit. Of but these are <laughs> actually <laughs> these are actually there's a couple civilizations in this one that are like water based civ because there's all this water stuff in the new one I and so yeah and then uh, the the reason that one of the logic are that they're reason they're water-based civs is they're arriving later than the other civs did, which is why it's DLC, right? That's the narrative that goes along with it. And so they had to live on Earth while the tide, while the water level was higher, so they got used to living wow. on water. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the narrative that goes along with this civ. And you get movable cities. Yeah. Which is, I love the water-based cities in Alpha Centauri. That was, I loved doing that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you can move them this time? Yeah. Oh, man. So moving right along, we have Rebel Galaxy on October 20th, <laughs> which I'm excited for Rebel Galaxy. It looks great. Freaking out about that game. That great, game. Great soundtrack, too. Yeah, we yeah. have a video of us playing that, uh, me playing that almost a year ago with yeah. the developers, and it's really a fun if you had to Describe in a sentence. What would it be? Uh, I would describe it as sp- Assassin's Creed Black Flag in space. Wow, with the, the naval section. Yeah, the naval section of it, um, and like combined with a biker gang. Like that's kind of how I would put it. It sounds cool. It's this really gritty kind of game. It's a um, game that I've been wanting to play for years. It's really like, fun. honestly it, for when years. I got a chance to play it, it was really fun. So I'm looking forward to it. And now. some of, some ex Runic developers, the creators of Torchlight. Yeah, Tra- yeah, Travis Baldry yeah. and Eric Schaefer. Yeah. It's um, a two two man team, and they mm-hmm. like outsource some of the art and content and whatnot. But yeah, yeah, they were at um, uh, PAX and PSX, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember if they were PSX or not, but yeah, I've, I've seen it a couple times and played it once. And Eric Schaefer, I believe, is one of the creators of the original Diablo. Yeah, yeah. they so were on the Diablo about, team. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on, though, we have Guild Wars 2 has its Heart of Thorns expansion coming out on October 30th. Binding of Isaac Afterbirth DLC also mm. that day. Mm. And then we hit November, and November is the month, right? Yes. Like, this is this is the, the month of fall where it's going to be crazy. There's 
Call of Duty Fallout? Black Ops 3, I know everyone is pumped for that mm. more than any other game that month. Right? No, okay. Uh, so Fallout 4. <laughs> I was like, harsh, I man. Right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Nothing against Call Out, Black Ops. It's just I'm not mm. interested. They in are that. the most dangerous of ops. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> we have to respect that. Um, of all the ops, <laughs> they got the danger thing I mean, going. Pur- purple's close, but it's yeah. no Purple black, ops doesn't have the same ring. Red ops, you don't want that. So, so no <laughs> offense no offense to Call of Duty, but six days after Call of Duty comes out, Fallout 4 comes out. And, and all of our lives are over. The world yeah. just comes to a halt. And, yeah. and StarCraft as well. And StarCraft 2's Legacy, yeah. the you know Void expansion. Funny? You know, I, I, so I played the, the first StarCraft 2 and it came out and really had fun with that and then just kind of lost interest. I didn't want, it wasn't, wasn't following it. And then I saw the new and Blizzard and all of their... Their um, cinematic? Yes! Oh, it's crazy. It's so good. Like, the, when the Archon, like, come, and you're just going, yeah, I want that. So I don't, yeah. And I know the game's not going to be that experience, but, you know, I just, yeah. I had a similar response. Like, along the spectrum of races I like in StarCraft, mm-hmm. Protoss is at the very bottom, like, mm-hmm. way, way down there. I don't relate to them at all. They're fancy, like, kind of, like, vaguely, like, space Egyptian, expensive, like, units... I like Zerg. I like Terran. Zerg. Zerg. Yeah. <laughs> I love the Protoss carrier rush, though. But but yeah. watching that cinematic and watching the, like the Protoss fend for their lives in this like totally noble like sacrificial ways, like oh man, don't make me like them, Blizzard. Come on, <laughs> we had we had a good thing going. Don't complicate it. They were always they always felt like so like quite like fa- fancy. Like, yeah. Like, oh, you and your your golden spires exactly. and your giant, crystals. Yeah. yeah. But now you're surrounded. Please no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't die. And then you're like, oh man, you guys got screwed. That <laughs> I mean, sucks. Take your home world back. Let's do this. But can we talk about the um, real quick the, the Archon mode in, in yeah, multiplayer? I think this that's is exciting. This is one of the most clever things oh, bl- bl- Blizzard's this. doing. So they're basically letting you play multiplayer. Like like a two v two for example, in which you share responsibilities of one army. What? So this is yeah. a, this is a, a mode that you can match make in. It's not some like weird novelty mode. I mean, maybe I guess I don't know how the competitive community is going to receive it. But basically, yeah. that's a whole different way of like holding somebody back. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Age of Empires <laughs> two do that? Oh, maybe. Ago. I think like, I'm, really. I'm yeah. pretty sure I've played that in another strategy game, huh. but huh. not to like make it sound less cool because it's an awesome yeah. feature. I had a lot of fun with that. But it's a, it's a super clever response. So you see that the surge of League of Legends and MOBAs, yeah. mm-hmm. which is all about, well, focus. You're controlling one unit. There's no base, obviously. Obviously, you're managing your items, and that's mm-hmm. a kind of different metagame. But part of the reason I think the mainstream strategy gamer has, I mean, respectfully abandoned StarCraft is obviously it's incredible complexity. It's so, it's so difficult. Yeah. I, I, like. At a given moment, I would love to be playing StarCraft, but it's it's daunting to me. You know, um, I, I, there's a number of uh, people in the studio that have been talking about what you were just saying a lot because I am I was a competitive RTS player back a while ago. I, was a, I mean, not one of the major. I was a home world competitive player in the cases ladder and whatnot. Oh, nice ranked home world player, and um, I like. There's not really many RTS games out there that I want to play. I was a huge Subcom fan. I mean, I love Chris Taylor's stuff, and Subcom 1 and 2 were phenomenal. And I was a big old Guard Relic fan. I wasn't really a fan of... Um, Coming Call Heroes. Of, yeah, Coming <laughs> Heroes yeah. 2 didn't do it for me. Um, but all the rest of their stuff I played to, you know, till I got... Yeah, but the there's not really... RTS games out now that really do that for me anymore. It's sad. Yeah. Well, the like, other thing that the other thing that Archon Mode is going to kind of go a little bit to solving, and I don't know if if, if it does get picked up in a competitive format yeah. as an esport, then it is a significantly lower barrier of entry in how you have to keep your skills. APM will matter significantly less yeah, when I you're really playing like that with idea. Archon mm-hmm. Mode, especially because well, you could play a role. Yeah. yeah, it's like you know what you do all. You're the guy who has all the click fest stuff. I can handle this other thing. And mm-hmm. do the like base building, and the other guy does the fighting. Yeah, yeah. Makes well, we'll see how the that. how the meta pans out with yeah. that too. Like, right, you're right. What's gonna happen is you're gonna have twice as much to do. <laughs> yeah, and everyone at the <laughs> same APM like yeah, just clicks yeah. per minute. Somebody yeah. added like yeah. four player mode. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then after that, a week after uh, that is Star Wars Battlefront comes out on November seventeenth, which I'm excited for I, to a degree. I'm like really cautiously optimistic about it. Hmm. Um, I, think I look at that. Look at uh, I don't. That was a yeah. What's that what's a, that, that shake? Was a, that was a thing. I, I have no hope that okay. No like, hope. Okay, so is that called New Hope? <laughs> I know. New hope. I know. About, I know. Battlefield is a popular franchise. How many people? I don't know how many Battlefield games you guys have played. I abandoned them after a month. Every single yep. time. That's about right. And I, I, under, I see that there's some depth there, but I have very little hope that Battlefront will have enough depth to keep me in it beyond a month, mm. just like every other Battlefield game. I, and, and I know it's not an identical experience. We were actually, this is something we were afraid of before we played it. It was mm. just going to be reskinned. It's not, which is very encouraging. 
But what we played of it is just, uh, I mean, the weapons are, are very symmetrical, you know, from like LMGs down to assault rifles, down to pistols in terms of how like the recoil patterns and stuff like that. The most interesting thing about it when we played on like the Hoth map was the, the jump pack it was like extremely fun. It sort of bound between these trenches. Mm. We had to aim yourself and there was an, that anticipation and, and, and like spontaneous movement. So I don't know, the, the vehicle stuff is, is very uh, kind of gimmicky to me. It's, it's like a power up system. You just uh, you pick up a f- like a floating icon on the ground like you would find in Mario Kart, and you activate that ATST or that Tie Fighter, and you jump into it. So I don't know. I I think it'll be a good game built for a massive audience, but will be a great competitive game, maybe. I think never maybe underestimate not. the Star Wars factor, though. Like people will people will play Star Wars things for a longer than average amount of time. Yeah, I still have people that are playing Battlefront too, even though it's offline only now because yeah. of GameSpy being down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I, I, I think a lot of gamers have that same uh, evaluation. Like, I really want this to be good. Yeah. yeah. I'm cautiously optimistic that it's going to be, like, everything they release. One thing I've been, ex- uh, I've been encouraged with is that it's not narrow. Like, they've created a lot of different experiences. Like, when they did the whole, like, space combat mode and they have the different game modes of the ground. Right. Like, they're trying to find... They know, they, like, I think they recognize the fatigue. And they're like, can we create some different appetites that players can enjoy inside of our game experience? And I think that was clever of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also really dangerous. I mean, if anyone has the, the resources to pull it off, it's going to be dice. But, you know, it's, it's a lot to bite off. Mm-hmm. It's a lot yeah. of game to bite mm-hmm. off. I'll say that it is gorgeous. I mean, I, I haven't been as visually impressed by a multiplayer game in, in some time in, t- yeah. in terms of their ability to capture something that really truly resembles the cinematic universe or whatever. It's it's immediately striking the moment you sit down with it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, and then we have two days after that, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Enough, Tom. Stop. Uh, stop well, the games. <laughs> I know. There's so <laughs> many big ones We right have now. to review all of these? Are you serious? Um Honestly, well, Fallout won't take very long, right? Oh, Fallout no. 4 is a pretty short it's like experience. A 15. Yeah. 20 you're, hours. You're in, you're out. The, yeah. dog, the dog does most of the work. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he can pick up anything. You just say, pick up that. There's a, there's a command. Oh. There's a, you pull up that like radial UI, and you're like, it's like, pick up wrench, pick up ammo, build me something, get me a sandwich, and then like defeat the Give me a sandwich. You know, it's defeat fun. the MBL. Am M-Bot. I the only <laughs> one, you know, and I, I, I am excited about Fallout 4, obviously. I'm loving that. But I, when I first saw the trailer, I'm like, is Peter Molyneux on Fallout 4? <laughs> like, when did the dog become a thing? I'm yeah. pretty sure I've seen this thing before. Well, there's a lot. I thought that was the first thing I thought. He, he the, sure, the sure thing is that no matter how long Fallout takes, you're not going to have time to play it all because there are so many other games coming. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we didn't list, there's just more and more. Real quick on Fallout 4, I saw, yeah. I saw the headline today. Your companions won't be able to die, which is super disappointing to me. Really? That's disappointing? Yes. I think that just get frustrating in when a game d- that big. It's a huge missed opportunity for, for loss in that game. You want that I moment guess. where you're just like, no, death claw, don't kill yeah. my For girl. real. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I played Fallout 3, and I remember running through the like wasteland for 30 minutes, <laughs> and then it just said, dog meat has died. He just like fell off a cliff somewhere. <laughs> so for me, okay, because true. of that one that's experience, <laughs> I'm happy about that. But, but okay. I'm, I'm with you from another perspective. <laughs> I think it's all right, but... I mean, I, I, I just, I feel like I just get frustrated by that in the same way that, in, like, in Metal Gear Solid Five, if my companions could die, I would, like, hate yeah. my life. Like, I would just make that so frustrating. The fact that D-Dog can just kind of, like, run up to guys and, like, get shot and then walk away is, like, vital to the pace of that game, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving on, though, let's finish up with, uh, finish up the por- podcast portion with the Twitch chat Q&A. We're just going to take some questions. If you guys are watching... Uh, at home on Twitch, drop your questions in. Tag us with at PC Gamer, and it'll be highlighted. Demon? Yes, yes. <laughs> the Caco Demon will we toss pass you. it around. Whoever's yeah. asking. The, the Cow Cow Demon compels you to um, ask good and questions. And if you are listening either on YouTube or the podcast on iTunes or on PCGamer.com, then we do broadcast the Twi- PC Gamer Show every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time from Twitch.tv/slash PC Gamer, so you can come here and answer, uh, ask your own questions if you want to watch it live. Um, but yeah, no, I, you tried throwing the caco demon at me, I think it was last week, for to have be like the speaking stone, and it just hit me in the mic, and it was a sad <laughs> Sorry. day. Sorry. Bad things happen. Violated some, some HR rules. Those things. I, didn't, yeah. I didn't see it coming. Um, so yes, we don't have too many questions right, right now, but are you guys like, is there anything that like, you guys have on your mind that you didn't bring up yet, or anything you're excited about that's coming up? I mean, hmm. Anything that I'm like, I mean, I'm I'm just, 
I'm excited in general because it feels like the industry is kind of in this rotation point right now. Like the last year or two has been a weird time for PC gaming, it feels like a really weird time. And I, I remember um, we were uh, a transitional prepping. time for sure. Yeah, we yeah. were prepping for early access. And I'm like, I remember a period where every day I would be looking on Steam for what was coming out. I'd be yeah. so excited. And then there's just a period of year where most of this time I'm just like, uh. I, mean, I guess I'll just play the stuff that I already have. Yeah, like, it's I, too I just, much. It's it's too much of things that are are just in a weird way. I don't want to say vanilla. It just feels even. It feels like nothing is spiking out, and I'm going, yeah, I want to play that. And um, I it feels like that's been shifting a little bit. Like there are some games that are coming out that I'm genuinely going. I've wanted to play this for a while. I'm excited about this yeah. thing. There's this game called Dungeon Defenders Two, which yeah. I've never heard about. <laughs> yeah, really good, yeah, so. and I mean Warhammer is a uh, yeah. Cheers. Um, but I mean even. Even with like uh, you know Fallout coming out and having that new experience that we haven't had in a while, people have been yeah. trying to do it, but that hasn't been around for a little while. We haven't played that for a while. Um, having a Civ come out recently and seeing them mess with it again. Um, honestly, some of the not just the the Warhammer game that you're working on, but some of the new Warhammer games coming out next year mm. are like Total blowing War, yeah. my mind. Total War looks it's so be crazy. good. Yeah, looks so good. I actually wasn't excited about Total War. <laughs> I was just kind of like, oh, and I'm, again, I'm on the sci-fi side. And then the newest videos came out. Yeah. And I'm watching it going, what? Dwarfs with flamethrowers fighting against yeah. spider cavalry. And like, the spells how could you not they, be excited? Yeah. And the spells they cast, like just meteors raining yeah. from them. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, but that's what's fun about Warhammer is like, <laughs> All right. you can do so many crazy <laughs> yeah. things. You don't get that in generic fantasy. Like yeah. Warhammer is so special in that sense. That's what's that was, fun about it. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm geeking out a little bit. Nice. So, that'll be fun. Uh, so... My beards are actually James, our intern in the other room, asks about TwitchCon, what's going to be there, and what we're doing there. So I'm going to be going to TwitchCon for Friday, all of Friday and all of Saturday, and you guys are going to be at TwitchCon as well, mm-hmm. right? Um, so just to give you a little preview of what I might have is I'll be playing Paladins, the new shooter from Hi Res. So I'll get a chance to Ooh, talk about that. Really? Yeah, that'll be fun. Um, I'll be going to a giant H1Z1 battle royale tournament. Ooh. Nice. By, or that streamers are playing in, which is going to be fun. It should be a, a cool experience. Yeah, Twitch um, going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. We actually, um, we actually do a lot to encourage our Twitch. We have a thing that we call the Casters Guild, um, and we organize a lot of the Twitch streamers that play DD2 and mm-hmm. help support them. We actually created some unique cosmetics that only the Twitch streamers could give out. So it's like if there was a certain streamer that has a certain following, say, hey, here's a cosmetic that you can give out whenever you want on your stream. And um, we're really looking forward to hanging out with them and meeting them in person. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Nice. Armor Donio asks, can I get my snake to play Vermintide or would that be unfair? Eating rats (laughs) is the implication Uh, there. You know, you're very welcome to try. And (laughs) if you do, please record it because I would love to see a snake playing Vermintide. Uh, It's not a peripheral we support Right now. But, not, you know, not yet. If that works out, yeah, we should definitely do it. A, a <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Croniums asks, are you interested in Timothy Zan writing a StarCraft novel? I hadn't heard about that. Huh. No. Um, mm. I'm excited now. There we go. That sounds cool. Um, you know, it, it's it, uh, they've done a couple Warcraft novels, I believe, at this point. I haven't read any of them yet. Um, a StarCraft novel could be really fun. Hmm. Yeah, I would like that a lot. I mean, I love anything that's, that's, that's good sci-fi that's written well. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll just consume it. I'm reading, like, hard sci-fi right now uh, on this trip. So, yeah. Uh, JBJ Blaze asks, with the Mad Max movies having been released on Steam as well as other less popular movies, do you guys think there's a bigger future for popular movies to be available on Steam? Do you think this is a good for Steam and our Hollywood indie filmmakers, et cetera? Yeah, Devolver Digital, you know, the folks that make... They published uh, Hotline Miami, for example. They're also a, f- a f- like indie film label down in Texas. So they've you've seen some of their stuff kind of creep onto Steam, which is great. I, I think it's exploratory right now for, for Valve and Steam. But also we mentioned the Steam link earlier. You're going to have that ability to bring that Steam interface into your living room if it's not there already. Hmm. Naturally, that's where people watch films most times. So, yeah, I think yeah, that would be a good... Good yeah, that definitely makes sense. I think as long as it doesn't sort of sacrifice the interface aspects of Steam that we enjoy, that doesn't become so bloated that it becomes a new app store yeah. or, or Amazon or something, which is just impossible for me to navigate. I mean, they've already Steam already has that challenge right now with the current amount of content that it is that's on there. Yeah, um, that's for sure. And they they've, they're trying curators to try to help it, and that's had a little success, but not really. Yeah. They're opinion. doing more like tailored results now as well, where you get like your recommended. Games that's helped kind of some stuff. too. Yeah. It's just difficult because um, you know. I, I, 
you kind of want a curated list, even if it's going to be movie content. You want to kind of know what. I mean, Netflix does a good, really, really good job with that. Yeah. It's like here are the genres. We might have hundreds and hundreds of movies, but like you can scroll and it mm. tells you like the ones that you probably are going to be interested in yeah. first. Um, Amazon is the king of that. They tell you what you want to buy before you even know you wanted to buy it, just mm. by what you searched on Google the other day. Um, you know, having Netflix, yeah. uh, having Steam get b- um, better at that as they add more content. What's interesting about the movie thing is that I think Steam just experiments. You know, Valve always is experimenting. So like, no, let's throw, let's throw movies up there and see what happens. Just, yeah. And if you, it works, yeah. then we'll feed it. If it doesn't, we'll stop. So. Exactly. I'm yep. curious to see what happens there. Uh, I just had one. Now it's gone. There we go. Uh, Chicken Fever 69. Chicken Fever. Lovely name. Amazing. Asks, have any of you played Undertale yet? Uh, I have not. Undertale. And I know that James is playing it yeah. right now. Yeah, I've heard and it's excellent. liking it. Yeah. yeah, really funny sort of lo-fi adventure game, as I understand. Mm. But yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it. RPG, the, the combat system has, it's like a very weird, unique combat system where like it's almost like playing little mini games instead yeah. of actually like fighting. You go on a date with a skeleton, so. Yeah. What could be better? There's that. that. Um, that's date that's the spirit. Skeleton. Is that this? That's that's just the one lighter on the box. It's like you don't even really know what the game is about. You go on a date with the skeleton, figure it out. That could be the name of the game. So. Yeah. Uh, Daniel M. Tanos asks, do you think Steam should sell digital novels? Ooh, uh, they actually. I don't think they they like have a a list for it, but I've actually seen novels being sold on Steam already, like as DLC kind of stuff. Mm. And, I see no reason why. Oh, that's right. There was a couple, like, uh, there there were... um, uh, There were guides. Well, no, no, there was a, uh, what was it? It was a bundle deal. Mm -hmm. You bought, like, a collector's edition, and it came with, like, a PDF novel. I can't remember the name of the game that it was Mm with. You know know what I'm talking about? There was a... But, you know, it's interesting. I I am so old school, I want a book. Like, (laughs) I still even use Kindle. I buy my books. I still, I'm like, I'll go to the Barnes & Noble... Um, I like going to bookstores and browsing and buying books. You know, I don't. I, I don't really understand, or uh, I don't ag- like not agree. I just don't understand people who are crazy about like getting discs for all their games. No. But I totally understand books. Books is such a different thing it, when you have the paper and the smell of the book and it stuff like so that. Feels so different. And I like. I like having. Like I have a library at my house, yeah. you know, and it's like you have your bookshelves, with all your books on them, and it's just I. Some people are like, oh, you know, you buy all of your books, do you ever reread them? And it's like, yeah, I've read some of these series like three times. Mm-hmm. I've. I'll go and reread the whole thing over again. Nice. So, yeah. I know there's a game that sells printable paper craft on Steam, though. Really? I forget the name of it, but yes. That's cool. Well, I mean, people, in a certain sense, it's all that different type of media. I mean, a lot of people sell soundtracks now, too. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's just it was more a really, media. There was a really cool game that came out a couple years ago called Ring Runner. Do you guys remember that game? It was this really fun indie game made by uh, two brothers, I believe. And it was the reason why I mentioned this. I should have brought this up, actually. I don't know why I mean, we were talking about the novel thing. Um, they're, they they made the game over like course of four or five years, just two guys um, and some some help. But the one of the brothers also wrote a book at the same time, and he was never been a published writer before. So he wrote this whole book about the game at the same time as in making the game. And I actually one of our, our creative director bought it for me as a Christmas present. And I read it, and it starts off you can tell he's trying to figure out how to write, and then as it gets later on, he gets pretty good at it, and the ending is really really strong. Hmm. And then the game is actually it's this two D like fun, really like mo- very deep multi-mechanic game. They're working on a new product now, I think, that's a little more focused because um, their first game was just so all over the place. They've been working on it for four or five years. Um, but that would have been really cool if they had sold it on Steam because when I saw that it had a book, I actually didn't know how to get it and I was talking about it and that's uh, Dan Haddad, one of the creditors, just found it and got it for me. But I'm like, if it had been there on Steam, yeah. I would have just bought it right then and there. I wouldn't even thought about it. It's like, yeah, I'll buy this guy's book. <laughs> that looks really cool. Exactly. So to finish up the show, um, we got to play uh, Dungeon Defenders 2 mm. uh, with Brad before the show started. And it, if you didn't get to see that, you can check it out on our YouTube channel later today or on our Twitch VODs now if you'd like. But mm. I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're going to take uh, just end the show with a, a little bit of Vermintide gameplay. This is a new video mm. that you guys haven't shown yet. Um, so we're going to – it's about an eight-and-a-half-minute gameplay video. Um Oh, there's that moon you're talking about. Yeah, yeah there is the moon you're talking about. So, Liam, I guess, what, why don't you just set the scene for us of what we're going to see Sure. In this? So what we're playing right now is uh, the first level of the game. It's called the Horn of Magnus. And uh, basically, you've just entered the city of Ubershrike and realized that something horribly wrong is happening. And you're going to be seeing four of the five heroes right now trying to kind of get their way through the city. And so a little fun note right now. We're seeing the witch hunter is... is the perspective is from the witch hunter, which is um, actually... 
he was bringing back the Bright Wizard, which you can see a bit further ahead, back to prison. Or, or kind of like to go to a trial. And the Empire Soldier, which was right ahead, was helping her out with that. Or helping him out with that. So it's just kind of a funny setting of the end. So this is essentially just what you would see, like, this is basically just, like, starting around, right? Yeah. This is just the game. Exactly. And, um, and we talked before about, like, having the director-driven AI. It's always the case if you're not really sure what's going to be around the next corner. So right now we're playing the Witch Hunter with a one-headed axe and with a brace of pistols, which these pistols kind of work like, you know, how old pirates would do it, where you have one gun and then you kind of drop it, and you pick up another one, shoot it, drop it. He has 50 ammo, which is kind of funny when you think about it, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, and the ammo, too, when I got my hands on the game a long while ago, it, it seemed like, you know, you didn't have much ammo pretty often, and you guys were pushing towards melee combat a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the first things we said when we wanted to build this game, was we wanted to make a co-op game with a heavy melee focus. And mm -hmm. so you can certainly, like, play a range style and be more focused around the range combat, but it, you are going to have to use melee in some situations if you want to be successful. And it has been a tricky challenge of like getting that melee combat to feel really satisfying and like because you are very close up and personal with the enemies and getting the impact to feel just right and, and making sure that it doesn't feel floaty has been one of the big challenges. I'm sure it's, it seems like a technical challenge. Am I, am I yeah. cor correct in thinking that? I mean, it's something that a lot of developers either hyper simplify or just avoid altogether. Um, but yeah, in terms of collision, it seems like it's uh, definitely. I mean, we, yeah. we try to put you right up in the action, uh, and it's also like. Well, someone just got pounced by a good order. <laughs> I actually haven't seen this video. <laughs> so I'm not sure what you're going to see. Oh, wow. I love the, I love the surprise for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I love the, like, puffy arms that come into the shot occasionally. Yeah. Like, it's this, like, badass dude wielding an axe and guns, but he's got this, like, poofy yeah. red and blue thing on. You know, if, if there was a shop that sold Warhammer fashion, I think it'd actually go, <laughs> go down really well. So tell me a little bit about how you guys approach... You know, you're, you're fighting this enemy, the Skaven. There, there are kind of multiple tiers of them. They have, you have your elite Skaven that you're also fighting throughout the game, which are kind of the equivalent of the Special Infected. But for those common enemies, how do you guys approach making those fun and interesting to fight over hundreds of hours, potentially? You know, one of the things is we want you to feel like a hero. We want you to, like, make sure that you actually feel powerful because in the context, these five heroes taking down, like, the entire horde of Skaven, that's a tricky situation to be in. So they're pretty, like, well-versed and good fighters. Mm -hmm. So part of it is we want to put in a lot of just basic enemies like the, the Skaven slaves, the clan rats, which are going to be easier to take on. But then having the elite Skaven, which come in and you have, like, a... You know, I think when we played before at PAX, we had the Storm Vermin Patrol that you saw. Right. Because you have this patrol of eight big, like, Storm Vermin. You can avoid them entirely if you're if you're just careful enough and kind of play stealthy. But if you run into them, it's going to be a really big and difficult fight. So it's been it's been that balance of, like, having those, like, oh, shit moments where something big is approaching and you, you're not really sure how to deal with that situation. But also having the, the moments where it's kind of easier and... That was the guy that's the, the hooker, right? Yeah, that's the, he's called the pack master. So I guess like, hooker would be an inappropriate name. You know, we, we talked about that. <laughs> he has like a yoke. Yeah. yeah. And he's grabbing. What's fun about him is he'll actually, if you can pull a player far enough, he'll hoist them up on the stake and just hang them from it. Hmm. So that stick has these like spikes that go into your neck. It's not, it's not very pleasant. Uh, the Skaven race aren't nice guys to be around. But it's an interesting challenge to, to build that sort of, you know, that low level of enemy that simultaneously needs to needs to be a break from those difficult encounters, yeah. needs needs to act like sort of make you feel empowered. But they also need to create problems for you. They have that, that, that totally opposite dual role of they need to be dangerous and easy at the same time. Exactly. And I mean, part of it is is that what we were talking about earlier, is it okay for you to lose? Is it okay if the players just completely right. wipe around? And that's part of it always. We want to have that consistent challenge where like, if you mess up in a situation, that's going to be the end and you have to start again. And so one thing we're doing for like the really hardcore players is obviously having difficulty levels. And on the very highest one, one of those regular clan rats is going to take, it's going to take, take about three or four hits and then you're down. So we really want it to be like a deadly situation. And that's going to be the most kind of real challenging one. And we, you showed off when, when I played the game a while ago that there was this really great thing that we, you'd get like ambushed. You'd be walking yeah. under an under, overhang and like suddenly the rats would just drop from around you, which is something that when we did it, talked about how you can't do that with zombies. Mm. Like it's very similar to Left 4 Dead, but also like there are things like that where this narrative and this setting just keep, allow you to do things that you just would not be able to do with shambling dead people. Definitely. I mean, Skaven are the star of the show. Like, we, we've worked a lot on their mobility, making sure that they can go around the levels, all sorts of places. They can climb anywhere and, and come out of anywhere, and you there's just no safe place. That's It's been really one of the cores. See, this is nice to see for me, because when I got to play, it ended right as we went through that gate. Yeah. So uh, I actually think this video is going to end before we go through 
Or did you, did, did we not make it through the gate when we played? No, it? we we got okay. through this because we played a long time ago. So right. we got through that gate, and then it was just like a tease of rats coming at me, and and we had to gotcha. stop. And Evan, you played as well at PAX, is that right? Yeah, I, I played a couple different levels, not not being shown here. Uh, we played a forest level. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, t t tell me more about the, uh, you guys' approach to the item system. I mean, mm -hmm. th there's loot, but it's not strictly like a, a total linear progression that you're constantly getting better and better stuff. There are, yeah. there are different items you can equip for different characters in terms of I can have a sword and a shield or a two-handed weapon or something. Exactly. So we have about 50 different types of weapons, and that again ties into like the Warhammer lore where an elf would never use a dwarf weapon, vice versa. You know, they all have their little kind of own things that they want to use, and, and um, the way that we give the players loot is partially it's when you level up you're going to be getting new items just to kind of make sure that you always have something for every hero initially but then we have a loot system whereby if you get to the end of a level we're going to give you some loot dice we talked about a little bit before and you roll those dice that's going to kind of determine what you get so you might get an, an item of uh, various rarities you might get something that's a little bit more powerful and kind of lets you take on the next difficulty maybe or you can get something for a hero that you're not playing a hero you're playing it's all sorts but having like 50 types and then having hundreds of variations on that just makes sure that if you play 200 hours, you're still going to be finding new stuff. That rapid fire, like, yeah. dual pistols was <laughs> really cool there. Um, yeah, that's also, I mean, like, every weapon type, we try to make sure that they have their own little flavor to them. Like, those that brace of pistols where you can just kind of go crazy, we want moments like that for players who want to play that way with every type of weapon. Mm -hmm. It's just this big blunderbuss, which I really enjoy, which is, like, it's a really slow kind of shotgun weapon. But firing that, you can take on, uh, you can kill a bunch of enemies at once. So right oh now, this is, a, this is the Rat Ogre, which is one of the biggest enemies. I guess he's the biggest enemy in the game. Uh, he is kind of a boss event type deal, but we never know where he's going to spawn, if he even spawns. One time we were playing a couple weeks back, we had uh, two of them spawn in one level, which is kind of deadly. But you're going to see that he's a, he's a big challenge. You really have to kind of coordinate with your team and make sure that one of you is trying to take, like, um, keep him. him busy. Yeah, trying yeah. to kite him, keep him busy. You've got a dodge mechanic in the game where if you can kind of dodge just as he's attacking, you can avoid his attack. Because you can block them, but with some attacks, he's going to throw you away. You know, there's no there's no shield that's going to save you from that guy. And you said you didn't know when he would show up because you're using a similar uh, system similar to Left 4 Dead's director AI, right? Exactly. Where it, it kind of dynamically chooses when, when these events happen. Yeah, I mean, if you kind of think of it like the term director, if you look at a movie, movies are often made in the sense that you have like a, a conversation type scenario and then you have like an action sequence and then a conversation. I guess you could say in a way that the game the game's director kind of looks at it similarly, where, you know, our characters will have dialogue between them. They kind of talk talk to each other, have a bit of banter, tell the story, and then you'll have an action sequence, and then you'll have something else happen. And we never quite know what it's going to be. Sometimes you'll play around, and it's just, like, total chaos all the time, and there, there's no preparing for that, you know? It's it's all about just cooperating. That's what you can do. So let, let's kind of peer behind the scenes, if, if you'll allow us, in, into sure. that, in that director, quote-unquote, system. I mean, what are the variables... That, that Vermintide's looking at when it when it's analyzing, like, do, is now the right time for me to throw a rat or ogre at somebody? Like, what is the game analyzing? The big one, I would say, is intensity, just, like, how much has the director been throwing on the players at once and things like, you know, is there only one player left? Maybe you want to quickly end that round. Maybe you don't want to end that round. It's like, there's always a little bit of random, mm. but we try to make sure that it's mostly about keeping the pacing kind of consistent but also a little bit crazy at all times. The intensity is the big one. If you're just kind of rushing through a level, the intensity is just going to go up. <laughs> like, that's it's a part of it. I right. just I just put the video on just sure. while we finish up our conversation as well. But um, so a, w a question I saw was: Is there going to be any PvP or is it just? Uh, we're focusing strictly on co-op. Yeah. For now, it's one of those things where there is so much that you can do with Warhammer, and I think our conversation earlier just kind of <laughs> yeah. touches that. Uh, you know, we when we started just pitching the game internally, we talked about having like tons of characters and loads of different features, and we just kind of looked at it and went, you know, if we're ever going to finish this game, if it's ever going to be a really good experience, we have to kind of narrow it down. So the co-op is what we're really focused on. And I mean, down the line, like we want to support this game for as long as people want to play it. So if if the community is constantly saying, you know, we need verses, we'll definitely look into that post-launch. But for launch, 100% co-op. But I, th I still think that people are really going to dig that. And I mean, if you compare it to Left 4 Dead, we focus a lot more on like the loot system, having that kind of a metagame outside. So I think there's definitely going to be a ton of replayability. And what about the, the structure of the game itself? You know, it, it's set in and around this, this epic Warhammer fantasy city uber shriek yeah uh but how many how many levels how many maps uh, how would you sort of categorize that uh, we're looking at about 13 levels for launch i think there might be a 14th that's in the works i don't want to announce anything but yeah they're, they're somewhere around there <laughs> and um obviously you're gonna be playing them several times because you're gonna be getting more and more loot and and it's a lot of 
kind of pushing yourself to the harder difficulties is going to be one of the exciting parts. But in terms of like what kind of levels you can expect, we have the, the forest level that we talked about earlier. We have levels down on the Skaven territory, so you actually get to go to the Under Empire and experience that, which is super cool. I don't actually think that's been done in a video game before, so that's kind of exciting. And, uh, you know, we try to make it shift things up a bit between levels, kind of keep a bit of... I mean, we don't have specific game modes that you can swap between, but we do have levels that are almost like a, a horde mode type deal or like more of a like defend the point and mm. more linear. So we do try to shift things up between the levels. And I think players are going to find this is my favorite level because it kind of plays this way and want to master that. Cool. Great. And, and when can we expect to play Vermintide? So I think, <laughs> uh, I think I'm coming back here tomorrow to actually play with you guys. You Am are, right? yeah. Yeah, so... Let's see if I don't have a little surprise for you then. Okay. Is, you guys is, heard it here first. We might be working on a surprise for you guys. So. All right. I'm, we'll see I'm how excited. That goes. Sounds great. We'll, we'll so we, we will be, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Liam, uh, for you. showing us that gameplay. It looks really good, by the way. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love the caster. I love the fire. <laughs> the beam of fire at one point. She's a lot of fun. One. Yeah. I want to <laughs> she's my favorite cool. hero. Like, she, she is fun because she's, she's like a crazy old lady with just like pyromaniac personality and yep. what's fun about her is like she casts the fire magic you can overcharge her if you do that she likes to explode and die so <laughs> it's a fun moment where like you're playing with your friends reward, like, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> either one player just goes crazy or it's like okay we have a catastrophic moment right now I'm playing the right wizard. I'm just going to save everybody by killing myself. You know, it's, it's a fun mechanic. Cool. Well, that's very Warhammer. Yeah. Talking about. Exactly. Right? It goes back to Me that. Like, mechanically, you're, you're kind of embracing that weirdness. That's exactly. cool. So, Liam will be back to play uh, Warhammer End Times Vermintide live with us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We'll actually be playing the game hands-on then. Um, we did get a chance, like I said earlier, me and Brad and Philip got a chance to show off Dungeon Defenders 2 earlier, right before the podcast portion of the show, and you can go back. You can expect that on YouTube very soon and also just on our VODs on Twitch. Um, I recommend you take a look at that, too, because we talked about a lot of really cool things with where the game is going and how you guys listen to your community and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that's all we have today for the PC Gamer Show. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Liam and Brad, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was guys. great to have you on, seriously. Thanks for having us, man. It was a lot of fun. Good thanks fun. a lot. And then, of course, as always, thank you, Evan, for... For being on and being yourself. Being me. Thanks, yeah. thanks Tom. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday yeah. at 1 p.m. He has the thanks Tom tone. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> thanks, Tom. He has exactly the right intonation. <laughs> 1 p.m. Pacific time next Tuesday, or if you're watching on iTunes, or listening on iTunes or watching on YouTube, then whenever pleases you. Um, thanks very much, guys, and we'll see you next week. Bye. See ya. <laughs>